Small Gods by Terry Pratchett Read by Tony Robinson Now consider the tortoise and the eagle. The tortoise is a ground-living creature. Its horizons are a few inches away. It has survived by being on the whole no threat to anyone and too much trouble to eat. And then there is the eagle, a creature of the air and high places, lightning death on wings, talons and claws enough to make a meal of anything smaller than it is. And yet the eagle will sit for hours on the crag until it spots a distant movement and then it will focus, focus, focus on the small shell wobbling down there on the desert and it will leap. And the tortoise finds the world dropping away from it and it sees the world for the first time and it thinks what a great friend I have in the eagle. And then the eagle lets go. The story takes place in desert lands. When it begins and ends is more problematical. History has to be controlled. Things have to happen at the right time. So history has its caretakers. They live in a hidden valley in the high ram tops of the disc world where the books of history are kept. These are the books from which history is derived. There are more than 20,000 of them. Each one is 10 feet high and bound in lead. When people say, it is written, it is written here. The 493rd abbot folded his wrinkled hands and addressed Lutze, one of the most senior monks. The place is Omnia, he said, on the Latian coast. I remember, said Lutze, dry place. Haven't been to Omnia for, oh, must be 700 years. Off you go, then. I shall take my mountains said Lutze. The climate will be good for them. It was the year of the notional serpent, which meant that the time of the eighth prophet was imminent. And it came to pass that in that time the great god Om spake unto Baratha, the Chosen One. Psst! Baratha paused in mid ho and stared around the temple garden. Pardon? It was a fine day early in the lesser spring. Bees loafed around in the bean blossoms, but buzzed fast in order to give the impression of hard work. High above, a lone eagle circled. And at the far end of the garden, old brother Lutze was dreamily forking over the dung heap. Baratha shrugged and got back to the melons. Yea, the great god Om spake again. Psst! Baratha hesitated. Perhaps it was a demon. The thing to do was to be resolute and repeat the nine fundamental aphorisms. Once more, the great god Om spake unto Baratha. Are you deaf, boy? The hoe thudded onto the baking soil. Get thee behind me, demon. I am behind you. Baratha turned again slowly. The garden was still empty. The third thing people noticed about Vorbis was his height. He was well over six feet tall, but stick thin. The second thing that people noticed about Vorbis was his eyes. Not just dark of pupil, but almost black of eyeball. It was as if he had sunglasses on under his skin. But the first thing they noticed was his skull. Most of the church's ministers cultivated long hair and beards that you could lose a goat in, but Deacon Vorbis was bald by design. He shaved all over, he gleamed, and lack of hair seemed to add to his power. He didn't menace, he never threatened, for Vorbis was the head of the Quisition, and he knew his destiny. Hadn't the god himself told him? He didn't often go down to watch the Inquisitors at work. Exquisitors didn't have to. He sent down instructions. He received reports. But special circumstances merited his special attention. Currently, he was sitting alongside the bench on which lay what was still technically the trembling body of Brother Sasho, formerly his secretary. He leant over. What were their names? Don't know. Sasho, they are treacherous heretics 
don't know names. I trusted you, Sasho. You betrayed the church. No names. Truth is surcease from pain, Sasho. Truth? Yes. Sasho opened his one remaining eye. Truth? Yes. The turtle moves. Brother picked up his hoe and turned back to the vines. The blade was about to hit the ground when he saw the tortoise. It was small and basically yellow and covered with dust. Its shell was badly chipped. It had one beady eye. Baratha looked around. The gardens were well inside the temple complex and surrounded by high walls. How did you get in here, little creature? he said. Did you fly? The tortoise stared monoptically at him. I don't think tortoises are allowed in the gardens. Aren't you vermin? The tortoise continued to stare. How would you like a grape, little tortoise? How would you like to be an abomination in the nethermost pit of chaos? said the tortoise. Eventually, Baratha opened his eyes and took his fingers out of his ears. I'm still here. It dawned on Baratha very slowly that demons and succubi didn't turn up looking like small old tortoises. I didn't know tortoises could talk, he said. They can't read my lips. Baratha looked closer. You haven't got lips. No, I'm doing it straight into your head and I don't have to waste time on gardeners. Go and fetch the top man right now. Top man? The high priest, or whatever he calls himself. I suppose there is one. Baratha nodded blankly. High priest, right? High priest? I can't go asking the... Baratha hesitated. Even the thought of talking to the Cenobiarch frightened him. I can't ask anyone to ask the high Cenobiarch to talk to a tortoise. Turn into a mud leech and wither in the fires of retribution! The tortoise bounced up and down furiously. There's no need to curse. That wasn't a curse. That was an order. I am the great god Om. Baratha blinked. No, you're not. I've seen the great god Om. He comes as an eagle or a lion or a mighty bull. There's a statue in the great temple. It's got horns of real gold. I am the great god Om, said the tortoise, in a menacing and unavoidably low voice. And before very long, you are going to be a very unfortunate priest. Novice. What? Novice, not priest. Get him! Fetch him now, or the moon will be as blood, and agues and boils will afflict mankind! I'll see what I can do said Baratha, backing away. His grubby robe disappeared through the gateway. Vorbis's room was in the upper citadel, which was unusual for a mere deacon. He hadn't asked for it. He seldom had to ask for anything. He also got visited by some of the most powerful men in the church's hierarchy. Not, of course, the six archpriests or the Cenobiarch himself. They were merely at the top. The people who really run organisations are usually found several levels down. Two of them were with him now. They were General Iam Friat, who ran the Divine Legion, and Bishop Daruna, secretary to the Congress of Iams. And now, Vorbis said, the matter of Ephibi, after what they did to poor Brother Murdoch. The insults to Om. This must not pass. What is proposed? Uh, no more fighting, said Fright. We've lost too many already. They fight like madmen. They have strong gods, said Daruna. There is no god but Om, said Vorbis. Have you seen this? He pushed forward a scroll of paper. Daruna gave it a cautious examination. I believe there are other copies, even in the Citadel. This one belonged to Sasho. It is to be regretted that he has not been induced to give us the names of his fellow heretics. 
General Fright fought against the sudden rush of relief. His eyes met those of Vorbis. De Chelonian mobile, Daruna said. The turtle moves. What does that mean? Vorbis's eyes had not left Fright. The writer claims that the world travels through the void on the back of four huge elephants which stand on the shell of an enormous turtle. <laughs> Daruna grinned nervously. And the man who wrote this walks around free in a Phoebe now. The council want to parley with a Phoebe, said Daruna. I have to organise a deputation to leave tomorrow. How many soldiers? A bodyguard only, said Fright. We have been guaranteed safe passage. And once inside, can we surprise them? We? I shall lead the party. I was just musing as to the possibilities should we be provoked. Fright clicked his knuckles, a habit of his whenever he was worried. We have given them our word. There is no truce with unbelievers. But the palace of Ephibi is a labyrinth. No one gets in without a guide. In my experience, there is always another way, which the god will show in his own good time. And we must not forget poor brother Murdoch. He was unarmed and alone. Fear is strange soil. Mainly it grows obedience, like corn which grows in rows and makes weeding easy. But sometimes it grows the potatoes of defiance, which flourish underground. The Citadel had a lot of underground. There were the pits of the Quisition, there were cellars and sewers, forgotten rooms, even natural caves in the bedrock itself. This was such a cave. Smoke came from the fire in the middle of the floor. There were a dozen figures in the dancing shadows. They wore rough hoods. And something about the way most of them moved suggested men who were used to carrying weapons. On one wall of the cave, there was a drawing. It was vaguely oval. A child's drawing of a turtle. We must kill Vorbis, said a mask. Not in Phoebe, said another. It must happen here, when we're strong enough. Then one of us must go to Ephibi and save the master, if he really exists. He exists. His name is on the book. Didactylus. A strange name. It means two-fingered, you know. Bring him back here, if possible, and the book. One of the masks seemed hesitant. His knuckles clicked nervously. But will people rally behind a book? They're peasants. They need a symbol. We have one! Instinctively, every masked figure turned to look at the drawing on the wall. The turtle moves. The turtle moves. The turtle moves! The leader nodded. And now we will draw lots. The great god Om waxed wrath. But there is a limit to the amount of wrath that can be waxed one inch from the ground. He cursed a beetle. The beetle plodded away. He cursed a melon unto the eighth generation. But the melon just sat there, ripening slightly. Well, when Om got back to his rightful shape and power, he told himself steps would be taken and something really horrible would happen to all eagles. By the time the big boy arrived back with the waxy-skinned man, the great god Om was in no mood for pleasantries. What's this? he snarled. Baratha knelt down. This is Brother Noomrod, master of the novices. I didn't tell you to bring me some fat old pederast. Novice Baratha, Noomrod said, for what reason are you talking to a small tortoise? Because it's talking to me, isn't it? Brother Noomrod looked down at the small one-eyed head poking out of the shell. Tortoises was a new one. I have to tell you, Baratha, that it is not talking. You can't hear it? I cannot hear it. It told me it was the great god. 
Ah, well, this sort of thing is not unknown amongst young men recently called to the church. The tortoise bounced up and down. Smite ye with thunderbolts! I find healthy exercise is the thing, and plenty of cold water. Nomrod wandered off towards the kitchens. There's very good eating on one of these, you know. They make excellent soup. Baratha leant against the wall and looked down at the tortoise. I know you're not the great god Om, he said. The great god would never become a tortoise, but it says in the book of the prophet Sinar that when he was wandering in the desert, the spirits of the ground and the air spoke unto him. The tortoise gave him a one-eyed stare. I think I'll recall him. Tall fella, full beard, talked to himself, walked into rocks a lot. He wandered in the wilderness for three months. Yeah, that explains it. Perhaps you are a demon. Your teeth to abscess with red-hot heat. Pardon? I swear to me that I am Om, greatest of gods. Your lying tongue cannot tempt me, reptile, for I am strong in faith. The tortoise grunted with effort. Smite you with thunderbolts! A small, a very small black cloud appeared over Baratha's head and a small, very small bolt of lightning lightly singed an eyebrow. Ouch! Now do you believe me? Baratha hoed the bean rows for the look of the thing. The great god Om ate a lettuce leaf. In the rainforests of Baratha's subconscious, the butterfly of doubt emerged and flapped an experimental wing, all unaware of what chaos theory has to say about this sort of thing. I feel a lot better now, said the tortoise. Better than I have for months. Months? How long have you been ill? What day is it? Tenth of Garoon. What year? Um, Notional Serpent. Then... Three years. This is good lettuce. Let there be another leaf. Baratha pulled one off the nearest plant, and lo, there was another leaf. And you were going to be a bull? Open my eyes, my eye, and I was a tortoise. Why? I... I don't know, lied the tortoise. But you're omnicognizant. That doesn't mean I know everything. Yes, it does. Thought that was omnipotent. No, that means all-powerful. And you are. That's what it says in the Book of Ossory. Who told him? You did. No, I didn't. He said that you spoke unto him from out of a pillar of flame. Oh, that Ossory. And you dictated to him the book which contains the directions, the abjurations and the precepts. 193 chapters. I don't think I did all that. Perhaps he wrote it himself. Baratha put his hands over his mouth in horror. That's blasphemy! What? Baratha removed his hand. That's blasphemy! How can I blaspheme? I'm a god! I don't believe you. Want another thunderbolt? You call that a thunderbolt? The tortoise hung its head sadly. All right, not much of a one, I admit. If I was better, you'd have just been a pair of sandals with smoke coming out. It looked wretched. I don't understand it. I intended to be a great big roaring white bull for a week and ended up a tortoise for three years. I was beginning to think I was a tortoise dreaming about being a god. Perhaps you are. Your legs to swell to tree trunks. But, but you're saying the prophets were... Just men who wrote things down. It wasn't from you. Some of it, perhaps. I've forgotten so much the past few years. The tortoise paused. Can I say something? Om searched his fading memory. I remember a summer day. You were thirteen. Your grandmother had beaten you for stealing cream, which in fact you had not done. She locked you in your room and you said, I wish you were... Vorbis strolled through the citadel. He always made a point of taking a daily walk through some of the lower levels. 
He rounded a corner and saw, scratched crudely on the wall opposite, a rough oval with four crude legs and even cruder head and tail. He smiled. There seemed to be more of them lately. Let heresy fester. Let it come to the surface like a boil. Vorbis knew how to wield the lance. But the second or two of reflection had made him walk past a turning, and instead he stepped out into the sunshine. This was one of the walled gardens. Bean vines raised red and white blossoms towards the sun. Melons baked gently on the dusty soil, and a plump young novice was rolling in the dust with his fingers in his ears. Vorbis prodded Baratha with his sandal. What ails you, my son? Baratha opened his eyes. There weren't many members of the hierarchy he could recognise. Even the Cenobiarch was a distant blob in the crowd, but everyone recognised Vorbis the Exquisitor. Baratha fainted. How very strange. There was a small tortoise near his foot, hissing like a kettle. Vorbis picked it up, examined it carefully, found a spot in full sunshine and put the reptile down on its back. After a moment's thought, he wedged a couple of pebbles under the shell so that the creature's movement wouldn't tip it over. Then he turned his attention to Baratha. There was a hell for blasphemers. There was a hell for liars. There was probably a hell for little boys who wished their grandmothers were dead. The Omnians had a great many hells. Currently, Baratha was going through all of them. Brother Noomrod and Brother Vorbis looked down at him, tossing and turning on his bed like a beached whale. It's the sun, said Noomrod. The poor lad works all day in that garden, a very willing lad. He's the one I told you about. He doesn't look very sharp. He's not. Yet you tell me his tutors speak highly of him. Noomrod shrugged. He is very obedient and, well, there's his memory. He has got a good memory. It's superb. A devoutly read young man. He can't read. All right. How then has he become such a capable pupil? He listens. He listens to everything. And he takes it all in. Vorbis stared down at Baratha. He appeared to be thinking deeply. Loyal. Loyal and devout. And a good memory. Send him to see me when he has recovered. I may have a use for him. Yes, Lord. For, I suspect, the great god Arm moves in mysterious ways. The sun beat down on the upturned shell of Arm. An upturned tortoise is the ninth most pathetic thing in the entire multiverse. An upturned tortoise who knows what's going to happen to it next is, well, at least up there at number four. You died if you had no believers. That was what a small god generally worried about. But you also died if you died. He was too tired to waggle his legs now. I'm on my back and getting hotter and I'm going to die. And yet... And yet that bloody eagle had dropped him on a compost heap, the one thing that would break his fall without breaking him as well, and really close to a believer. Made you wonder if it wasn't some kind of divine providence, except that you were divine providence. And on your back, getting hotter, preparing to die. A shadow crossed the sun. Om squinted up into the face of Lutze, who turned him the right way up, picked up his broom and wandered off without a second glance. Sergeant Simony waited until he was back in his own quarters before he unfolded his scrap of paper. It was marked with a small drawing of a turtle. He was the lucky one. Someone had to bring back the writer of the truth to be a symbol for the movement. It had to be him. The only shame was that he couldn't kill Vorbis. But that had to happen where it could be seen, in front of the temple, one day. Bloody useless boy, Om thought, served himself right for trying to talk to a novice, but where did it leave him? It left him in this wretched garden, nothing else for it. He'd have to find the Cenobiarch himself. 
A high priest would be bound to be able to hear him, and he should be easy enough to find. He'd have to go upwards. That's what a hierarchy meant. You found the top man by going upwards. Wobbling slightly, his shell jerking from side to side, the former great god Om set off to explore the citadel erected to his greater glory. High above, no sound but the hiss of wind in feathers. The eagle stood on the breeze, looking down at the toy buildings of the citadel. It had dropped it somewhere, and now it couldn't find it. Somewhere down there, in that little patch of green. There were few steps in the citadel. The progress of the many processions that marked the complex rituals of Great Om demanded long, gentle slopes. Such steps as there were, were low enough to encompass the faltering steps of very old men, and there were so many very old men in the citadel. But the tortoise has very inefficient legs. Thou shalt build shallower steps, he hissed, hauling himself up. Feet thundered past him a few inches away. This was one of the main thoroughfares of the citadel, leading to the place of lamentation. Anyone could go to the place of lamentation. It was one of the great freedoms of Omnianism. Prayers and entreaties could be offered up. They would assuredly be heard. They might even be heeded. Behind the place, which was a square 200 metres across, rose the great temple itself. When the sun rose, the doors of the central temple blazed like fire. They were bronze and a hundred feet tall. On them, in letters of gold, were the commandments. There were 512 so far. It was generally believed that staring fixedly at the golden horns on the temple roof while uttering the prayer gave it added potency. Thousands of pilgrims visited the place every day. A heel knocked Om's shell, bouncing him off the wall. On the rebound, a crutch caught the edge of his carapace and whirled him away into the crowd, spinning like a coin. The god blinked muzzily. This was nearly as bad as eagles. He caught a few words before another passing foot kicked him away. The drought has been on our village for three years. A little rain, oh lord! Rotating on the top of his shell, vaguely wondering if the right answer might stop people kicking him, the great god muttered, No problem! Another foot bounced him, unseen by any of the pious, between the forest of legs. The world was a blur. Then he landed, right side up, in a brief, clear space. Visible. From his perch on the horns of the temple, the eagle leapt into the sky. Eagles are single-minded creatures. Once the idea of lunch is fixed in their mind, it tends to remain there until satisfied. The tortoise's one eye swivelled upwards in dread anticipation. A small grey priest ushered Baratha into a small, barely furnished room. He pointed at a stool. Baratha sat down. The priest vanished behind a curtain. Baratha took one glance around the room, and blackness engulfed him. A voice by his ear said, Now, brother, I order you not to panic. They put a hood over your face. All the novices knew that. Stories were told in the dormitories, so the inquisitors didn't know who they were working on. Good. Now we are going into the next room. Hands guided him across the floor. He felt the brush of the curtain, and then was jolted down some steps and into a sandy-floored room. There is a stool behind you. Be seated. Baratha sat. You may remove the hood. Seated on the stools at the far end of the room were three figures. He recognised Deacon Vorbis. The other two were a short, stocky man and a very fat one, a genuine lard tub. All three wore plain grey robes. There was no sign of any branding irons. Novice Baratha, said Vorbis. Baratha nodded. Do you recognise these learned fathers? Baratha shook his head. They have some questions to ask you. Baratha nodded. The very fat man leant forward. Do you have a tongue, boy? Baratha presented it for inspection. Vorbis smiled. Baratha, please put it away. Now, 
When you first came into my apartment, you were in the anteroom for a few seconds. Please describe it. About three meters square, white walls. There is a window about two meters up. Um, three bars in the window. There is a holy icon of the prophet Ossery, carved from a fascia wood, and there is a scratch in the bottom left-hand corner of the frame. There is a shelf under the window. There is nothing on the shelf but a tray. On the tray, a bronze thimble, two needles, and a length of cord, three knots in the cord, and nine coins were on the tray. Tell me about the coins. Three were citadel scents, two showing the horns, and one the sevenfold crown. This is some sort of trick, said the fat man. Baratha, tell us about the other coins. They were bronze. Direct my from a Phoebe. How do you know this? I have seen them once before, Lord. When was this? I think it was around midday, on Garoon the Third, in the year of the astounded beetle. Some merchants came to our village. How old were you? I was within one month of three years old, Lord. Can you remember everything that's ever happened to you? said the stocky man. Uh, no, Lord. Most things. What is the first thing you can remember, my son? said Vorbis kindly. There was a bright light, and then someone hit me. The three men stared at him blankly. Then they turned to one another. The stocky man nodded. The fat man shrugged. Baratha, said Vorbis, return to your dormitory now. You will report to the Gate of Horns at dawn tomorrow, and you will come with me to Ephibi. You know about the delegation to Ephibi? Baratha shook his head. We are going to discuss political matters with the tyrant. Do you understand? Baratha shook his head. Good. Very good. It was only a matter of time before the eagle stopped circling and swooped. The great god Om scurried towards the nearest statue. The statue happened to be himself as a bull trampling an infidel, although this was no great comfort. Gods have no one to pray to. But everyone needs someone. Baratha! Baratha gravitated towards the garden. There were beans to tie up. You knew where you were with beans. Besides, if he was going to be away for a while, he ought to mulch the melons and explain things to Lutze. Lutze came with the gardens. Every organisation had someone like him. Everyone knows who they are, and no one remembers a time when they weren't there, or knows where they go to when they're not, well, where they usually are. Generally, Lutze was pushing a broom, or turning over a heap of compost, when Baratha entered, he was raking the paths. He was good at raking paths. He left scallop patterns and gentle, soothing curves. Baratha hardly ever spoke to Lutze, because it didn't matter much what anyone ever said to Lutze. The old man just nodded and smiled his single-toothed smile. I'm going away for a little while. Nod, smile. Understand? Nod, smile. Nod, smile, beckon. What? Nod, smile, beckon. Nod, smile, beckon, smile. Lutze walked his little crab monkey walk to a little area at the far end of the walled garden. There was a small trestle table in the sun by a stack of bean canes. A straw mat had been spread on it, and on the mat were half a dozen pointy-shaped rocks, none of them bigger than a foot high. A careful arrangement of sticks had been constructed around them. Bits of thin wood shadowed some parts of the rock, Small metal mirrors directed sunlight towards other areas. Paper cones at odd angles appeared to be funnelling the breeze to very precise points. Baratha had never heard about the art of bonsai and how it was applied to mountains. De, very nice. Nod, smile, pick up a small rock, smile, urge, urge. Oh, I really couldn't urge, urge. Baratha took the tiny mountain. It had a strange, unreal heaviness. To his hand it felt like a pound or so, but in his head it weighed thousands of very, very small tons. It's very mountainous, Nod Grin. There can't really be snow on the top, can... Baratha! His head jerked up, but the voice had come from inside. 
Oh, no, he thought wretchedly. Barata! Oh, that was a dream, wasn't it? No, it wasn't! Help me! The petitioners scattered as the eagle made a pass over the place of lamentation. It wheeled only a few feet above the ground and perched on the statue of Great Om trampling the infidel. It was a magnificent bird, golden brown and yellow eyed, and it surveyed the crowds with blank disdain. It's a sign, said an old man with a wooden leg. Yes, a sign, said a young woman next to him. They gathered around the statue. It's a bugger, said a small voice from around their feet. But what's it a sign of? said an elderly man. It could be a messenger from the great god himself. It's a point. I mean, there's something very godly about an eagle. It's only a better-looking turkey, said the voice. Brain the size of a walnut. Very intelligent, too. Interesting fact. Eagles are the only birds to work out how to eat tortoises. They pick them up and drop them on the rocks. A uh, Amazing. That sounds dreadful. I wonder what passes through the poor little creature's head when he's dropped. He shall, madam, said the great god Om. At that moment, trumpets rang out across the place. The eagle leapt into the air. The worshippers fought to get out of its way as it dipped across the flagstones and then rose majestically towards the hot sky. Below it, the doors of the great temple, each one forty tons of gilded bronze, opened ponderously and silently. Brother's enormous sandals flapped and flapped on the flagstones. He ran from the knees, lower legs thrashing like paddle wheels. Baratha! The square, normally alive with the susurration of a thousand prayers, had gone quiet. The pilgrims had all turned to face the temple. Baratha shouldered his way through the crowd. Baratha! The Cenobiarch was returning to his apartment after conducting the evening service. Baratha leant against the statue, panting. No one was paying him any attention. They were all watching the procession. Watching the procession was a holy act. Baratha knelt down and peered into the scrollwork around the base of the statue. One beady eye glared back at him. How did you get under there? It was touch and go, said the tortoise. I tell you, I never had this trouble when I was a bull. The number of eagles who can pick up a bull you can count on the fingers of one head. There's good eating on one of them, you know, said a voice. Baratha stood up guiltily, the tortoise in his hand. Oh, hello, Mr. Dehibla. Everyone in the city knew cut me own hand off Dehibla, purveyor of suspiciously new holy relics, suspiciously old sweetmeats on a stick and long past the sell-by dates. He was there every dawn, selling sticky things to the pilgrims, and the sight of someone in the place trying to unstick their jaws with dignity was a familiar one. Many a devout pilgrim, after a thousand miles of perilous journey, was forced to make his petition in sign language. Fancy some sherbet for afters, said Debler, hopefully. I'm not going to eat it. Going to teach it tricks, then? Look through hoops, that kind of thing? Who is this fool? said Om. Get rid of him. Shut up. No need to be like that. I wasn't talking to you. Talking to the tortoise, were you? My old mum used to talk to a gerbil. Anyway, it'll be company on your journey. What journey? To Ephebe, the secret mission to talk to the infidel. Baratha knew he shouldn't be surprised. News went around the enclosed world of the citadel like bushfire after a drought. Can I press you to a candid sultana? On a stick? There were 23 other novices in Baratha's dormitory, on the principle that people by themselves might indulge in solitary cogitation. It was well known that this stunted your growth. For one thing, it could lead to your feet being chopped off. So Baratha had to retire to the garden. He fished out his god from the pocket of his robe. Look, I didn't have a chance to tell you. I'm going to Ephebe on a mission to the infidels. Deacon Vorbis picked me. Who's he? He's the chief exquisitor. He makes sure you're worshipped properly, lets out the badness and the heresy in people. There may be a little pain, but it ensures less time in the hells after death. But what if the exquisitors are wrong? 
They can't be wrong. They are guided by the hand of, 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 of by your hand. I mean, your claw. The testament of Ossery is very clear on the matter. We are judged in life as we are in death. Ossery 3, chapter 6, verse 56. My grandmother said that when people die, they have to cross a terrible desert. They come before you, and you weigh their heart in some scales. And if it weighs less than a feather, they are spared the hells. Om looked up at Baratha. He really believes, he thought. The strength of Baratha's belief burnt in him like a flame. And then the truth hit Om like the ground hits tortoises after an attack of eagles. The thing about Baratha's flame of belief was this. In all the citadel, in all the day, it was the only one the god had found. And the tortoise thought of the silent wastes of the deep desert and the gods who had faded away to mere voices on the air. Gods who were left behind, gods with no more believers. Not even one. One was just enough. You've got to take me to this Aphebe place, he said urgently. He was trying to keep his innermost thoughts calm in case Baratha heard. Don't leave me behind. General Fryatt was trying to pray. He hadn't done so for a long time. Of course, there'd been the eight compulsory prayers every day, but in the pit of the wretched night, he knew them for what they were. A habit. And he'd drunk too much tonight, from a secret cache of wine whose discovery would lead him into the machinery of the Inquisitors within ten minutes. He squeezed his eyes shut again, and all he could see was the face of Vorbis. Vorbis knew about him. He must do. How much had he got out of Sasha? Had he said what he knew? Of course he'd say what he knew. Something went snap inside Fryat. He glanced at his sword hanging on the wall. Why not? After all, if he was going to spend all eternity in a thousand hells, he staggered to his feet and got the sword belt off the wall. Vorbis's quarters weren't far away. One stroke. He could cut Vorbis in half without trying, and he could get to Ephebe, maybe, across the desert. He reached the door and fumbled for the handle. It turned of its own accord and the door swung inwards. Vorbis was standing there in the flickering light of an oil lamp. The sword clattered out of Fryat's hand. Is there something wrong, brother? Vorbis smiled and stepped into the room. Two hooded inquisitors slipped in behind him. How is it in there? said Baratha. I'm going to rattle around like a pea in a pot. Currently, Om was in a wickerwork box slung from Baratha's shoulder. Baratha stamped his feet in the pre-dawn chill. He didn't dare leave his post. He'd been told to be here. But after a while, sounds from around the corner made him sidle a few yards to see what was going on. It looked as though another party was preparing to set out. There seemed to be hundreds of camels here, complaining like badly oiled pumps and smelling like a thousand damp carpets. He wandered over to the nearest creature. A man was strapping water bottles round its hump, a member of the Divine Legion. A sword was half hidden under the desert robes. Good morning, brother. And where are you going to with all these camels on this fine morning? Bagger off. Woe unto he who defiles his mouth with curses, for his words will be as dust. Ossery, Precepts 11, verse 16. The soldier tightened a strap. Sod off, and forget you ever saw us. Sergeant Actar, chapter 1, verse 1. Baratha's brow wrinkled. He couldn't remember that one. I hope your journey is a pleasant one he said politely, whatever the destination. He backed away and headed towards the gate. The Ephebian travelling group was beginning to assemble now. Baratha saw a dozen mounted soldiers. What are you doing here, novice? One of the stable servants demanded. I am going to Ephebe. You're going to Ephebe? Yes. What makes you think that? Because I told him so. The stableman turned as though his feet were nailed to a turntable. My Lord Vorbis, he oiled, he will require a steed. And now are we all here? He raised an eyebrow at the sergeant of the guard, who saluted. We are awaiting General Fryat, Lord. Ah, 
Sergeant Simony, isn't it? Yes, sir. We will proceed without General Fright. General Fright has most pressing and urgent business, which only he can attend to. Fright opened his eyes in greyness. He could see the room around him, but only faintly, as a series of edges in the air. The sword. He dropped the sword. He looked down. There was the sword. But his fingers passed through it. It was like being drunk. But he knew he wasn't drunk. He was suddenly clear in his mind. Good morning. Fright saw the tall black figure stride through the grey wall. You're death, aren't you? Indeed. Fright gathered what remained of his dignity. I know you. I have faced you many times. Death gave him a long stare. No, you haven't. I assure you, you have faced men. If you had faced me, I assure you, you would have known. But what happens to me now? Death shrugged. Don't you know? he said, and disappeared. Wait! Fright ran at the wall, and found to his surprise that it offered no barrier. Fright stepped through into a desert. The sky was dark and pocked with large stars, but the black sand that stretched away to the distance was nevertheless brightly lit. A desert. After death, a desert. No hells yet. Perhaps there was hope. Where is this place? This is no place. What is at the end of the desert? Judgment. Fright stared at the endless, featureless expanse. I have to walk it by myself? Death vanished. Fright took a deep breath, purely out of habit. Perhaps he could find a couple of rocks out there, a small rock to hold and a big rock to hide behind while he waited for Vorbis. And that thought was habit too. Revenge? Here? He smiled. Be sensible, man. You are a soldier. This is a desert. You crossed a few in your time. A desert is what you think it is. And now you can think clearly. There were no lies here. Just you and what you believed. What have I always believed? That on the whole... And by and large, if a man lived properly, not according to what any priest said, but according to what seemed decent and honest inside, then it would at the end, more or less, turn out all right. The desert looked better already. Fry it. Set out. Sergeant Simony and his soldiers rode ahead. They were trailed by the servants and lesser priests. Vorbis rode in the rear like a shepherd watching over his flock. Baratha rode with him, and Vorbis seemed to derive some amusement from his company. How many miles have we travelled, Baratha? Four miles and seven astardo, Lord. And how long has our journey taken? Seventy-nine minutes. He turned gingerly in the saddle. There was a cloud of dust about a mile behind them. Here come the rest of the soldiers. The rest of the soldiers? Sergeant Akhtar and his men. I saw them before we left. You did not see them. You will forget about them. After a few minutes, the distant cloud turned off the road, reached the top of the dunes and vanished in the silent wastes of the desert. Baratha tried to put it out of his mind, which was like trying to empty a bucket under water. No one survived in the high desert. There were terrors in the burning heart, an ocean without water, voices without mouths. The party paused on a hill and looked at the sea. It washes unholy shores, Baratha, said Vorbis, and gives rise to dangerous ideas. Men should not travel. As you travel, so error creeps in. Yes, Lord. In Osiris' day, we sailed alone in boats made of hide and went where the winds of the god took us. That's how a holy man should travel. 
I think that Ossery once sailed to the island of Erebus on a millstone. Nothing is impossible for the strong in faith. Try striking a match on jelly, mister. The voice of the turtle was heard in the land. Baratha stiffened, but Vorbis's horse trotted on. Ilderim was nothing more than a few shacks around a stone jetty, at which was a trireme flying the holy oriflame. The horses were led one at a time up the gangplank. Baratha found a place up near the pointed end, and he opened the box. The tortoise spoke from deep within its shell. Any eagles about? Baratha scanned the sky. No. The head shot out. Where are we? On a boat, on the sea. Wobbling. Baratha's stomach lurched, even though the boat had hardly cleared the jetty. They say that the god is sending us a fair wind. I am? Oh, yes. Flat as a mill race the whole way. Mill pond, I meant mill pond! In his box, Om tossed and shook as Baratha staggered across the moving deck and reached the rail. To anyone except the novice, the boat was clipping through the waves on a good sailing day. Seabirds wheeled in its wake. Ah, feeding the fishes, I see. No, Lord, I'm being sick. Baratha turned, and there was the Exquisitor, smiling. Him! Him! screamed the voice of the tortoise. I'd know him anywhere! Baratha felt the box trembling as Om bounced around inside. Kill him! Push him overboard! Come to the prow, Baratha, said Vorbis. There are many interesting things to be seen, according to the captain. Baratha trailed behind him and risked a whisper. What's the matter? Vorbis half turned. We will have our minds broadened, I'm sure. He pointed to a large bird gliding down the face of the waves. The pointless albatross, said the captain promptly. Really? Baratha, shouted the tortoise, are you listening to me? He turned me over in the sun. And over there? Oh, flying fish. And down there? Porpoises, sort of a fish. Do they always swim around ships like this? Certainly. Vorbis leant over the rail. This left a gap in the conversation, which the captain very stupidly sought to fill. They'll follow a ship for days. A tarpit of silence. This must be very convenient. It must be like having a travelling larder. The captain smiled. Oh, no, Lord, we don't eat them. You know the old saying, Lord? Saying that after they die, the souls of dead sailors become... The captain saw the abyss ahead. For a while there was no sound. But, of course, we are not prey to such superstitions. Well, of course, idle sailor talk. Vorbis was looking past his ear. You there? Fetch me a harpoon. A sailor scuttled off obediently. But, uh, er, uh, but your lordship should not attempt such sport. A harpoon is a dangerous weapon. You might do yourself an injury. But I will not be using it. The captain hung his head and held out his hand for the harpoon. Baratha lay on his back among sails and ropes under the decking. It was hot, and the air smelt of all air that has come into contact with bilges. But being cruel to animals doesn't mean he's a bad person. The harmonics of Baratha's tone suggested that even he didn't believe this. It had been quite a small porpoise. Besides, he's been kind to me. He turned me on my back. Have you looked at that man's mind? Humans can't read minds. I don't mean reading them. I mean seeing the shape of them. Om remembered Vorbis's mind, as impenetrable as a steel ball. He'd never seen a mind shaped like that on anything walking upright. A mind like that could do anything. But what he had to work with was Baratha, with a mind as incisive as a meringue. And if Baratha died... How are you feeling? You'll snuggle down under the sails a bit more. You don't want to catch a chill? 
There's got to be someone else, he thought. If you want to be up there again, it, it can't just be him who believes in me. Really, in me, not in a pair of golden horns. And now he's got himself involved with an eagle kind of person, if ever there was one. Om was aware of mumbling. What are you doing? Praying. What for? You don't know? Oh. If Baratha dies... The tortoise shuddered in its shell. If Baratha died, then it could already hear in its mind's ear the soughing of the wind in the deep, hot places of the desert, where the small gods went. Ragged clouds ripped across the skies. The sails creaked in the rising wind. White water crowned the waves. It was going to be a big storm. Baratha snored in his nest. Om listened to the sailors. Someone had killed a porpoise, and everyone knew what that meant. It meant the ship was going to be sunk. Om wondered if tortoises could swim. Turtles could. But those buggers had the shell for it. Oh, well, nothing else for it. He was still a god. He had rights. He slid down a coil of rope and crawled carefully to the edge of the swaying deck. Then he spoke. Nothing happened for a while. Then one wave rose higher than the rest and changed shape as it rose. Water poured upward, filling an invisible mould. It rose level with the deck, developed a face and opened a mouth. Well... Greetings, O oh Queen of... The watery eyes focused. But you are just a small god. You dare summon me? I have believers, so I have rights. And what rights do you demand? Save the ship. The Queen of the Sea was silent. You have to grant the request. It's the rules. But I can name my price. It will be high. It will be paid. The column of water began to collapse back into the waves. I will consider this. The ship rolled, sliding Om back down the deck. A flailing foreclaw hooked itself around a stanchion as Om's shell spun around, and for a moment both hind legs paddled helplessly over the waters. Something white swept down towards him, and he bit it. Baratha yelled and pulled his hand up, with Om trailing on the end of it. You didn't have to bite! The ship pitched and flung him to the deck. Om let go. When Baratha got to his knees, he saw the crewmen standing around him. Two of them grabbed him and dragged him towards the rail. Om screamed at the Sea Queen. It's the rolls! The rolls! He could hear, above the roaring of the storm, the silence of the desert. Wait, said Baratha. What are you doing? It's nothing personal, said one of the sailors. The sea wants a life. Yours is nearest. Can I pray to my god first? The sailors looked at one another. It was probably not wise to antagonise any god. The ship skidded down the side of a wave. You've got ten seconds. Baratha lay down on the deck. Another wave slammed into the timbers. Om was dimly aware of the prayer. He couldn't make out the words, but the prayer itself was an itch at the back of his mind. Don't ask me, he said. I'm out of options. The ship smacked down onto a calm sea. The storm still raged. The lightning surrounded them like the bars of a cage. Electric fire raged overhead. But the ship sped down a narrow channel of calm between grey walls of storm a mile high and then they could hear the thunder dying away. Baratha got uncertainly to his feet. The sailors had fled. Om? Over here. Baratha fished his god out of the seaweed. You said you couldn't do anything. I made arrangements. But there will be a price, he thought. It won't be cheap. Tidal waves, a couple of towns disappearing under the sea, something like that. It's unfair, really. One man killed a porpoise. What am I thinking about, he thought. Before I was a tortoise, I didn't even know what unfair meant. There were no more storms. The ship ploughed on in favourable winds under a clear sky. 
the days passed uneventfully. Vorbis stayed below decks for most of the time. The coast here was dunes with the occasional barren salt marsh. A heat haze hung over the land. It was the kind of coast where shipwrecked landfall is more to be dreaded than drowning. Towards the evening of the fourth day, the unedifying panorama was punctuated by a glitter of light. It flashed with a sort of rhythm. The captain called Baratha over. The deacon told me to watch out for this, he said. Vorbis had a cabin somewhere near the bilges, where the air was as thick as thin soup. Baratha knocked. Enter. There were no portholes down here. Vorbis was sitting in the dark. Yes, Baratha? Something's shining in the desert, Lord. Good. Tell me what you saw in the desert. Um, there were six flashes, and then a pause of about five heartbeats, and then eight flashes, another pause, and two flashes. Vorbis nodded thoughtfully. All praise to the great God. He is my staff and guide through hard places. You may go. Next day the ship rounded a headland, and De Phoebe lay before it a spilling of blindingly white houses all the way up a rock. It seemed of considerable interest to Sergeant Simony. As the crew made ready for port, Baratha watched the soldier who stood at the prow, staring fixedly as the city drew nearer. It was unusual to see him away from Vorbis. Wherever Vorbis stood, there was the sergeant, hand on sword, always silent, except when spoken to. Looks very white, doesn't it? Baratha said. The city... Very white. The sergeant turned slowly and stared. His stare was pure, simply hatred. The Ephebians were expecting them. Soldiers lined the quay. There were a lot of them. Brother trailed along, the voice of the tortoise insinuating itself in his head. So, the Ephebians want peace today. Doesn't look like that. Looks like we took a pasting and we're suing for peace. That's what it looks like to me. Baratha stared around. At intervals, along the road from the docks, were white stone statues. What are they? Well, the tubby one is Tuvelpit, the god of wine. The broad with the hairdo is Astoria, goddess of love, a complete bubblehead. And the ugly one is Ofla, the crocodile god, not a local boy. He's a Latian originally, but the Ephebians thought he was a good idea. You talk as if they were real. They are. There is no other god but you. You told Ossery that. Well, I exaggerated a bit. One of the goddesses had been having some very serious trouble with her dress. Petulia, goddess of negotiable affection, said Orm, worshipped by the ladies of the night. A god for painted Jezebels? Why not? There used to be none there. Look, belief is where you find it. There's even a god of lettuce somewhere. A god... Of lettuce? Why not? If enough people believe, you can be a god of anything. Oh! Baratha had walked into the back of a sub-deacon. The party had halted. A man was running down the street. He was quite old, and something about him made people think of the word spry. But at the moment, they would be much more likely to think of the words mother naked and dripping wet. In fact, none of the people in the street gave him a second glance. Baratha tugged at the cloak of one of the Ephebian soldiers. Excuse me, why did we stop? Philosophers have right of way. What's a, what's a philosopher? Someone who's bright enough to find a job with no heavy lifting. An inventor of fallacies, said Vorbis as they marched onwards. The cursed city attracts them like a dung heap attracts flies. Actually, a Phoebe's known for its philosophers. A lot of old men running around with no clothes on. More or less. They don't sound much use to me. Look at the highest tower on the rock. Baratha looked up. At the top of the tower, secured by metal bands, was a big disc that glittered in the morning light. What is it? The reason why Omnia hasn't got much of a fleet anymore. That's why it's worth having a few philosophers around. One minute it's does a falling tree in the forest make a sound if there's no one there to hear it, and then one of them says, Incidentally, a 30-foot parabolic reflector to shoot the rays of the sun at an enemy's ships would be very interesting. The one before that was some kind of an underwater thing that shot sharpened logs into the bottom of ships. 
The party had reached a gateway. The Ephebian captain turned. The visitors must be blindfolded. This is outrageous, said Vorbis. We are here on a mission of diplomacy. That is not my business. My business is to say, if you want to go through, you wear a blindfold. This is one of them life choices. Very well. Under protest. The blindfold was quite soft and totally opaque, but as Baratha was led, ten paces along a passage, then left five paces, diagonally forward and left three and a half paces, right one hundred and three paces, down three steps, turned around seventeen and one quarter times, down a slope that went down a metre every ten paces for thirty paces, and Baratha wondered what good it was supposed to do. The blindfold was removed in an open courtyard. Bowmen lined the yard. A bald, skinny man was waiting for them. My name is Aristocrates. I am secretary to the tyrant. Please ask your men to put down their weapons. Vorbis drew himself up to his full height. We are entitled to retain our arms. We are an emissary to a foreign land. <laughs> Not a barbarian one. Barbarian? You burnt our ships. Aristocrates held up a hand. This is a discussion for later. I am sure you would like to rest after your journey. You are, of course, at liberty to wander anywhere in the palace. And can we leave the palace? If you remember the way, but I must warn you, our ancestors put into the labyrinths many traps. Now, if you would follow me, the Omnians were housed in little rooms around a central courtyard. There was a fountain in the middle, in a small grove of sweet-smelling pine trees. There was a bowl of fruit in Baratha's cell, and a plate of cold meat. He fished the god out of his box. There's fruit, he said. So, eat up quick. You've got to go and find a philosopher. Find a philosopher? Right. Someone who can help me stop being a tortoise. But Vorbis might want me. You're just going for a stroll, and hurry up. There's other gods in Ephebe. I don't want to meet them right now. Not looking like this. The labyrinth of Ephebe is ancient and full of 101 amazing things you can do with hidden springs, razor-sharp knives and falling rocks. There isn't just one guide through it. There are six, and each one knows his way through one-sixth of the labyrinth. The furthest anyone ever got without a guide was 19 paces. Well, his head rolled a further seven paces, but that probably doesn't count. All of this was totally lost on Baratha, who padded amiably along the tunnels and corridors, and at last pushed open the gate into the late evening air. The city of Ephebe surrounded them. Dogs barked. Somewhere a cat yowled. Then a door burst open down the street, and there was the cracking noise of a large wine amphora being broken over someone's head. A skinny old man in a toga picked himself up from where he had landed, pulled a cobblestone loose and dived back through the doorway. There was a distant scream of rage. Ah, <laughs> philosophy, said Om. Brother peered cautiously round the door. Inside the room, two groups of men in togas were trying to hold back two of their colleagues. He bloody well accused me of slander, one was shouting. I didn't. You did. I merely suggested that if Zeno said all Ephebians are liars, see, he did it again. Then, since Zeno is himself an Ephebian, he himself is a liar, and therefore I'm going to lay one right on you, pal. Excuse me, please, Baratha said. The philosophers froze. Are you all philosophers? The one called Zeno stepped forward. That's right, we think, therefore we am. Ah, Zeno spun around. I've had it up to here with you, Ibid. He turned back to Baratha. We are, therefore we am. That's it. Have you been fighting? Fighting? Us? We're philosophers, said Ibid, shocked. But you were the cut and thrust of debate, Zeno said. Thesis plus antithesis equals hysteresis, said Ibid. The stringent testing of the universe, the hammer of the intellect upon the anvil of fundamental truth. Shut up! 
And what can we do for you, young man? Ask them about gods. Um, I want to find out about gods. Gods? <laughs> Relics of an outmoded belief system. There was a rumble of thunder from the clear evening sky. Uh, except for blind Eo, the thunder god, lightning flashed across the sky. And uh, Kubal, the fire god, a gust of wind rattled the windows. Uh, Flatulus, the god of the winds, he's all right too. Then Ibid said, Forgal, the god of avalanches, where's the snow line? 200 miles away. They waited. Nothing happened. Relic of an outmoded belief system. They all seemed to feel a lot better about this. After a while, they relaxed and seemed to forget about Baratha. Only now did he take in the room. He'd never seen a tavern before. The bar ran along one side of the room. Behind it were stacks of wine jars, racks of amphora, and cheery pictures of vestal virgins on cards of salted peanuts and goat jerky, pinned up in the hope that there really were people in the world who would buy more packets of nuts in order to look at a cardboard nipple. What's all this stuff? How should I know? Let me see. Brother unfastened the box and lifted the tortoise out. Oh, typical tavern. See that man clearing mugs? Say unto him, give me a... But alcohol mocks the mind of man, says the prophet Ossery. I never said it. Now, talk to the man. In fact, the man talked to Brother. Evening, sir. What'll it be? I'd like... A drink of water, please. Wine. And uh, something for the tortoise? What do tortoises usually drink? Uh, normally uh, a drop of milk with some bread in it. Bread and milk? You get a lot of tortoises? Oh, very useful philosophical animal, your average tortoise. Outrunning metaphorical arrows, beating hares in races. Very handy. Um, I haven't got any money. The barman leant towards him. Tell you what, the Clivities are just bought around, he won't mind. We get all sorts in here, Stoics, Cynics, big drinkers, the Cynics, Epicureans, Stochastics, Anamaxandrites, Epistemologists, Peripatetics, Synoptics, all sorts. That's what I always say, it takes all sorts to make a world. Are you a philosopher? Oh, it kind of rubs off on you after a while. Not even fresh bread, muttered Om, nose deep in his saucer. And the milk's off. Down the other end of the bar, the philosophers had started fighting again. Tell me, said Baratha, do any of them know much about gods? Oh, you'd want a priest for that sort of thing. No, I mean, what gods are, how gods came to exist, that sort of thing. The barman leant forward. If you haven't got any money, I don't think you're going to get much help. Talk isn't cheap around here. There's the expenditure on soap for a start, loofers, pumice stones, bath salts, it all adds up. There was a gurgling noise from the saucer. We've got to have a philosopher. I can't think, and you don't know how to. You can try old Didactylus. He's about as cheap as they come. Doesn't use expensive soap? Doesn't use any soap at all. Where can I find Mr Didactylus? In the palace courtyard next to the library. Just uh, follow your nose. We'll be going then. Don't forget your tortoise. There's good eating on one of them. May all your wine turn to water. Will it? said Baruther, as they stepped out into the night. No. Why exactly are we looking for a philosopher? I want my power back. But everyone believes in you. If they believed in me, they could talk to me. No one is worshipping any other gods in Omnia, are they? They wouldn't be allowed to. The Quisition would see to that. Yeah. It's hard to kneel if you have no knees. Come on, let's get back. In the middle of the night, Om awoke. There were noises from Baratha's bed. Baratha was praying again. Om listened curiously. He could remember prayers. There'd been a lot of them once, even if the words weren't worth listening to. And he had smitten good and hard in his time. Now he could just about walk through water and feed the one. Baratha's prayer was a piccolo tune in a world of silence. Om waited until the novice was quiet again and then walked out, rocking from side to side into the dawn. 
Vorbis glowered at the back of the head of Aristocrates, who was leading the party. All over the world, there were rulers with titles like the Exalted, the Supreme, and Lord High something or other. Only in one small country was the ruler elected by the people, and they called him the Tyrant. Candidates for the tyrantship were elected by the placing of black or white balls in various urns, thus giving rise to a well-known comment about politics. The tyrant was a fat man with skinny legs, giving the impression of an egg that was hatching upside down. He was sitting in the middle of the marble floor in a chair surrounded by scrolls. Oh, the Omnium Delegation! A smile flashed across his face like something small darting across a stone. He looked down again. I am Deacon Vorbis of the Citadel Quisition. Yes, I know. You torture people for a living. Mm. Please be seated. I have nearly finished. Finished what? The peace treaty. But that is what we are here to discuss. No, that is what you are here to sign. Library, library, library. Om stumped along a cobbled alley. He paused at the point where it opened into yet another courtyard. There were voices. Mainly, there was one voice. This was the philosopher Didactylus. Although one of the most quoted philosophers of all time, Didactylus the Ephebian never achieved the respect of his fellow philosophers. They felt he wasn't philosopher material. They asked questions like, is truth beauty and is beauty truth? But Didactylus posed the famous philosophical conundrum, yes, but what's it really all about then when you get right down to it, I mean really? And many people have quoted from his famous meditations, it's a rum old world all right, but you've got to laugh, haven't you? Om crawled closer to the voice. There was a very large barrel against the far wall, a sign chalked on a board. Didactylus and nephew, practical philosophers, no proposition too large, fresh axioms every day. In front of the barrel, a short man in a toga that must have once been white was kicking another one who was on the ground. Earn, you lazy bugger. I turn my back for half an hour and you go to sleep on the job. What job? We haven't had anything since Mr Poloxy the farmer last week and he only paid in olives. I shall probably get a good price for them olives. They're rotten, Uncle. Nonsense. You said they were green. They're supposed to be black. We got three obols for doing that proverb for Grillos the cobbler. No, he brought it back. His wife didn't like the colour. Which one was it? It's a wise crow that knows which way the camel points. I put a lot of work in on that one. He said he couldn't understand it. I don't understand cobbling, but I know a good pair of sandals when I wears them. Om blinked his one eye. He had found a thinker. He looked up at the wall behind the barrel. Further along was an impressive set of marble steps leading up to some bronze doors. And over the doors was the word Librum. He'd spent too much time looking. Urn's hand clamped itself onto his shell. Hey! There's good eating on one of these things. Peace negotiations were not going well. You attacked us, said Vorbis. I call it preemptive defence, said the tyrant. You stoned our envoy, an unarmed man. He brought it upon himself, Aristocrates will tell you, the tall man nodded. By tradition, anyone may speak in the marketplace, and at first everything was fine because people were laughing, and then your priest pushed over a statue of Tuvelpit, the god of wine, so they threw stones at him. Not many, and only after they'd run out of vegetables. They threw vegetables when they couldn't find any more eggs. And when we came to remonstrate... I'm sure sixty ships intended more than remonstrating, said the tyrant. And we have warned you, Lord Vorbis, there will be more raids on your coast unless you sign. He looked towards the sky, visible between the pillars. And now it is nearing noon. The day heats up. I suggest we meet again at sunset. I think our deliberations may take longer. Shall we say tomorrow morning? As you wish. 
In the meantime, the palace is at your disposal. When you require meals, mention the fact to the nearest slave. In Om, um, we have no word for slave. So I understand. I imagine that fish have no word for water. Brother stood up, knocking over his bench. He thought, they lied about Brother Murdoch. Vorbis said they beat him within an inch of his life and flogged him the rest of the way. And Brother Noomrod said he saw the body. Why don't I believe any of it? And what did he mean about fish not having a word for water? Another bowl of fruit was waiting on the table in Baratha's cell. There was also a man sweeping the floor. Um, are you a slave? Yes, master. That must be terrible. The man leant on his broom. You're right. I only get one day off a week. Baratha, who had never heard the words day off before, nodded. Why don't you run away? Oh, done that. Run away for a fortnight into Jelly Baby every winter. Do you get brought back? No. I have to come back by myself. It's in lifts on ships. You come back? Yeah. Abroad's all right to visit, but you wouldn't want to live there. Yeah, but you're not free. Oh, um, what's the difference? Um, you don't get any days off? Really? I think I'll give freedom a miss then, thanks. Um, have you seen a tortoise anywhere around? You want one? There's good eating on it. No, 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 no. It's all right. He's probably in trouble, Brother thought, as he hurried through the city. Everyone wants to eat tortoises. But he hasn't screamed for me, he thought. So maybe no one's cooking him. He reached the courtyard in front of the library. It was crowded with philosophers, all craning to look at something. I've got ten O-balls, says it can't do it again. There was a breathless pause. There. That's never a right angle. I'd like to see you do better. What's he doing now? The hypotenuse, I think. There was another pause, then a cheer. Yeah! All right! Double or nothing. Bet it can't do a dodecagon. It's a shame to take your money. Another pause. Oh, ten sides? Told you it wasn't any good. Another daft idea, Didactylus. The mass of philosophers broke up. Brother caught a glimpse of a circle of damp sand covered with geometrical figures. Om was sitting in the middle of them. How did we do, Ern? said Didactylus. Fifty-two old balls up, Master. Pity it didn't know the difference between ten and twelve, though. Cut one of its legs off and we'll have a stew. Cut off a leg? Well, you don't eat it all at once. Didactylus turned his face towards a plump young man with splayed feet and a red face. Yes? The tortoise does know the difference between ten and twelve. Dumb thing just lost me eighty old balls. Yes, but tomorrow, the boy began, as if he was carefully repeating something. Tomorrow, you should be able to get odds of three to one. Didactylus's mouth dropped open. Give me the tortoise urn. He's a god, said Baratha. Really? Didactylus turned Om over. The turtle moves, said Urn thoughtfully. What? said Baratha. Master did a book. Oh, just a little thing I knocked off, said Didactylus, running his fingers over Om's shell. Look, I'm looking for a philosopher, one that knows about gods. What do you want to know about gods? Baratha appeared to be listening. How they start, how they grow, and what happens to them afterwards. Didactylus put the tortoise into Baratha's hands. Cost money, that kind of thinking. Let me know when we've used 52 obols worth. Didactylus grinned. Right, come on into the library. He reached down beside him and picked up a rusty iron lantern. Suddenly, it dawned on Baratha. You're blind. That's right. But you carry a lantern. It's all right. I don't put any oil in it. A lantern that doesn't shine for a man that doesn't see. Yeah, works perfectly. And you live in a barrel? Very fashionable a barrel. Most of the philosophers do it. It shows contempt for worldly things. Mind you, Legibus has got a sauna in his. The library, announced Didactylus. 
Bertha looked around. Scrolls protruded from their racks like cuckoos piping the hour. These are all books? Oh, yes, said Didactylus. Everyone writes them here. You can't stop the buggers. And people can read them? Omnia was based on one book, and here were hundreds. Wisdom of the ages, this. Got to write a book, see, to prove you're a philosopher. Then you get your official loofer. And this is the book Didactylus wrote, said Ern. Baratha looked down at a picture of a turtle. There were elephants on its back, and on them something with mountains and a waterfall of an ocean around its edge. How can this be? A world on the back of a tortoise? This can't be true. Tell that to the mariners. Everyone who's ever sailed the rim ocean knows it. But surely the world is a perfect sphere, spinning about the sphere of the sun, as the Septuagint tells us. That seems so logical. That's how things ought to be. Ought? That's not a philosophical word. Gods, Om prompted. We're here to ask about gods. But is all this true? said Brother. Didactylus shrugged. Could be, could be. We are here and it is now. After that, everything tends towards guesswork. You don't know it's true? I think it might be. I could be wrong. Brother's mind was on fire. These people weren't sure. But he'd been sure, and Deacon Vorbis had a sureness you could bend horseshoes around. Sureness was a rock. You don't like it, do you? Brother had said nothing. I know about sureness. Before I was blind, I went to Omnia once, and in your citadel I saw a crowd stoning a man to death in a pit. It was a horrible sight. It has to be done, Brother mumbled, so the soul can be shriven. Oh, I'm not talking about the poor bugger in the pit. I'm talking about the people throwing the stones. They were sure all right. They were sure it wasn't them in the pit. Ern reappeared with another scroll. I've got a Braxis's on religion. Old charcoal Abraxas, said Didactylus, suddenly cheerful again. Struck by lightning fifteen times so far. You can borrow this one overnight if you want. This is it, said Om. Come on, let's leave this idiot. He spent years researching it. Went out into the desert talking to the small gods. Talked to some of our gods too, brave man. He says gods like to see an atheist around. Gives them something to aim at. Brother unrolled a bit of the scroll. Is that how people read in Omnia? said Ern. What? Upside down? I think, said Brother, that I'd better be going. I'm sorry to have intruded on your time. He picked up the tortoise, glared at Ern, and strode as haughtily as possible out of the library. Om crawled slowly along the length of a line. This Abraxas was a thinker and no mistake. Do you know how gods get power? By people believing in them. But Abraxas says belief shifts. People start out believing in the god and end up believing in the structure. I don't understand. I am your god, right? Yeah. Take a rock and kill Vorbis. Brother didn't move. You heard me. But he'll... The Quisition would... Now you know. You're more afraid of him than you are of me now. Abraxas says here, Around the Goddy there forms a shelly of ceremonies and buildings and authority until at last the Goddy dies. But you're not dead. Next best thing. So I've been thinking... You can be the next prophet. I can't. Everyone knows Vorbis will be the next prophet. Ah, but you'll be official. No, I'm not a prophet. No one will listen to me. Om looked him up and down. I must admit you're not the chosen one I would have chosen. Baratha! That's Vorbis. Brother wandered out into the dusk. Vorbis was sitting on a bench as still as a statue in the shadows. Ah, Baratha. Yes, Lord. Vorbis pointed his staff into the night. Let us walk. There was the sound of laughter somewhere in the darkness and the clatter of pans. The stored heat of daytime radiating from the stones made the night seem like a fragrant soap. If Phoebe looks to the sea, said Vorbis after a while, but the sea is mutable, whereas our dear citadel looks towards the high desert, 
And what do we see there? Brother turned and looked over the rooftops to the black bulk of the desert against the sky. I saw a flash of light on the slope. Ah, the light of truth. So let us go forth to meet it. Take me to the entrance to the labyrinth, brother. My lord? Yes, brother. I would like to ask you a question. Do so. What happened to Brother Murdoch? There was the merest suggestion of hesitation in the rhythm of Vorbis's stick on the cobbles. The real truth must sometimes be protected by a labyrinth of lies. Do you understand me? No, Lord. I mean, that which appears to our senses is not the fundamental truth. So did the Ephebians kill Brother Murdoch? In the deepest sense of the truth, they did. By their intransigence, they surely killed him. But in the trivial sense of the truth, Brother Murdoch died, did he not, in Omnia. But it was put about that the Ephebians had killed him in, in the trivial sense, thus giving you due cause to launch a, uh, a just retaliation. The deacon's steel-shod staff clicked in the night. You impress me, brother. I see a great future for you in the church. The time of the eighth prophet is coming. A time of great opportunity for those true in the service of Om. There was more laughter in the darkness and the twang of stringed instruments. A feast, sneered Vorbis. Even their generals are in there. Onward! The gateway to the labyrinth was wide open. Up a short side tunnel, the guide for the first sixths of the way slumbered on a bench, a candle guttering beside him. Brother? Yes, Lord? Lead the way. I know you can. Lord? This is an order, brother. Then tread where I tread, Lord. Not more than one step behind me. Brother, let his sleeping mind take control. The way through the labyrinth unrolled in his head like a glowing wire. I could run forward, he thought. I could hide, and he'd walk into one of the pits. Who would ever know? I would. Forward nine paces, and right one pace. Forward nineteen paces. There was a light ahead, yellow lamplight. Someone's coming. It must be one of the guides. Vorbis had vanished. Are you number four? The light came round a corner. An old man walked up to brother and raised the candle to his face. Where's number four? A figure appeared behind the man from out of a side passage. Brother had the briefest glimpse of Vorbis, who gripped the head of his staff, twisted and pulled. Sharp metal glittered in the candlelight. The lights went out again. Take the lead again. Trembling, brother obeyed. He felt the soft flesh of an outflung arm under his sandal for a moment. After a mere million years, the night air blew cool on his face, and brother stepped out under the stars. Well done. Can you remember the way to the gate? Yes, Lord. The deacon pulled his hood over his face. Carry on. There were a few torches lighting the streets, but passers-by paid them no attention. They guard their harbour, said Vorbis, but the way to the desert. Everyone knows that no one can cross the desert. Ah, the gate. There will be a watchman. Wait here. Vorbis disappeared into the gloom. After a while, Brother started to count to himself. After ten, I'll go back. Another ten, then. All right. And then... Ah, brother, let us go. Is there a watchman? Not now. Help me with the bolts. A small wicket gate was set into the main gate. Brother, his mind numb with hatred, shoved the bolts aside with the heel of his hand. The door opened with barely a creak. Outside was the occasional light of a distant farm and crowding darkness. Then the darkness poured in. You'd have to have a mind like Vorbis's to plan it. 
No army could cross the desert, but maybe a small army could get a quarter of the way and leave a cache of water, and another small army could use that cache to reach halfway, and another small army... It had taken months. A third of the men had died of heat and dehydration. Men were already dying before Brother Murdoch went to preach. You had to have a mind like Vorbis's to plan your retaliation before your attack. Vorbis sat upright in the tyrant's chair. It was approaching midnight. A collection of Ephebian citizens had been herded in front of him. Well, he said, we can now dispense with the peace treaty. Ephebi is now a diocese of Omnia. There will be a fleet here in a few days. He signalled to one of the guards. Who wrote this? A copy of the Chelonian Mobile was flung onto the marble floor. If the philosopher who wrote this does not own up, the entirety of you will be put to the flame. There was a movement in the crowd, and Didactylus stumped out, his barren lantern held defiantly over his head. Brother was standing beside the throne. It was where he had been told to stand. He watched the philosopher pause for a moment, and then turn very slowly until he was directly facing Vorbis. You are the perpetrator? Indeed. You dare to declare that the world is flat and travels on the back of a giant turtle? No. When every honest man knows that the world is a sphere? Baratha leant forward, heart pounding. My lord, he said no. That's right, said Didactylus. You deny it? Let it be a sphere, no problem. And the sun can be another larger sphere. Would you like the moon to orbit the world or the sun? But you wrote, you, you gave the turtle a name. Didactylus shrugged. Now I know better. Who ever heard of a turtle ten thousand miles long? But your lies have already poisoned the world. Then I shall write another book, a full retraction. In fact, with your permission, Lord, I will retire to my barrel right away and start work. A universe of spheres, balls spinning through space. Hmm. Yes, Lord, I will write you more balls than you can imagine. The old philosopher turned and very slowly walked towards the exit. Vorbis watched him go. Then he turned to the tyrant. So much for your gooey! The lantern sailed through the doorway and shattered against Vorbis's skull. Nevertheless, the turtle moves! Vorbis leapt to his feet. I want him caught! Now! And, Baratha? Yes, Lord? You will take a party of men, and you will burn the library. Urn clambered across the shelves like a monkey, pulling books out of their racks and throwing them down. I can carry about twenty, but which twenty? Always wanted to do that, murmured Didactylus happily. Upholding truth in the face of tyranny, one man, unafraid. Damn good shot, considering. The library door shook to a thunderous knocking. The hinges leapt out of the walls. The door thudded down. Soldiers scrambled over it, swords drawn. Ah, gentlemen. Leave him, said Brother, as he stepped over the door. But I've got orders, said a corporal. Are you deaf? If you are, the Quisition can cure that. You don't belong to the Quisition, no, but I know a man who does. You are to search the palace for books. Leave him to me. The corporal looked hesitantly from Baratha to his prisoners. Very good, corporal. I will take over. Sergeant Simony pushed his way forward. Go! Yes, Sergeant. Simony cocked an ear as the soldiers marched away. Then he turned to Didactylus. The turtle moves. I am a friend. Why should we trust you? said Ern. Simony dropped on one knee in front of Didactylus like a supplicant. Sir... I can save you. You have friends in unexpected places. I'll just kill this priest. Baratha backed away. No, I can help too. That's why I came. Vorbis means to burn your library. What can you do? sneered Ern. I can save it. What? Put it on your back and run away? sneered Simony. No, how many scrolls are there? About 700, said Didactylus. How many of them are important? Oh, maybe uh, a couple of hundred. The rest is just vanity publishing. I may be able to take more than that. Is there a way out? There's tunnels all through the rock. 
What do you intend? I don't believe this, said Ern. You're telling Omnians there's another way out? I'm inclined to trust this person. He's got an honest face. Speaking philosophically, what is your plan, young man? Get the books and... Oh, my God. Something wrong? Could someone fetch my tortoise? Brother looked at a scroll full of maps. He shut his eyes. For a moment, the jagged outline glowed against the inside of his eyelids, and then he felt them settle into his mind. Ern unrolled another scroll, pictures of animals, drawings of plants, and lots of writing. You can remember them just by looking, said Ern. Yes. The whole scroll? Yes. I don't believe you. Describe an ambiguous presumer. Don't know. So much for Mr Memory. He can't read, boy, that's not fair, said Didactylus. All right, the fourth picture in the third scroll you saw. Um, a four-legged creature facing left, uh, a large head similar to a cat's. There are six whiskers. The tail is stubby. He blinked. That was fifty scrolls ago. He saw the whole scroll for a second or two. Brother blinked again. He was conscious of a certain heaviness of mind, a feeling that if he turned his head sharply, then memory would slosh out of his ears. I feel, um, a bit... <laughs> he awoke with the smell of the sea in his nostrils. He was in some sort of shed. Such light as managed to come through its one unglazed window was red and flickered. One end of the shed was open to the water. A few figures clustered around something there. Brother gently probed the contents of his memory. Everything seemed to be there. The library scrolls neatly arranged. You're awake, then, said the voice of Om. Where are you? Your soldier friend has got me in his pack. Brother got to his feet and peered out of the window. The red light was coming from fires all over Ephebe, but there was one huge glow over the library. Guerrilla activity, said Om. Even the slaves are fighting. Then Brother heard a hiss from the other end of the shed, a metallic whirring noise, and Ern saying, There, I told you, just a block in the tubes. The group was clustered round a boat, but there was no mast. What there was was a large copper-coloured ball in a wooden framework. There was an iron basket underneath it, in which someone had got a good fire going. And the ball was spinning in its frame in a cloud of steam. I've seen that, Baratha said. There was a drawing. Yes, you're right, said Didactylus, illustrating the principle of reaction. I never asked Ern to build a big one. This is what comes of thinking with your hands. Now he was closer, Baratha could see that half a dozen very short oars had been joined together in a star-shaped pattern behind the copper globe and hung over the rear of the boat. Wooden cogwheels and a couple of endless belts filled the intervening space. As the globe spun... The paddles thrashed at the air. How does it work? Very simple, said Ern. The fire makes... We haven't got time for this, said Simony. Makes the water hot and so it gets angry. So it rushes out of the globe through these four little nozzles to get away from the fire. The plumes of steam push the globe around and the cogwheels and Legibus's screw mechanism transfer the motion to the paddles which turn, pushing the boat through the water. Simony prodded the mechanism with his sword. Have you thought of all the possibilities on land, perhaps on some sort of cart? Oh, oh, no point in putting a boat on a cart. Simony's eyes gleamed with the gleam of a man who had seen the future and found it covered with armour plating. Where's the priest? Didactylus said. I'm here. You went out like a candle back there. I'm, uh, I'm better now. Remembering the scrolls OK? I, uh, I think so. Ern turned away from the boat, where he was feeding more wood into the brazier under the globe. Can we all get on board? Brother eased his way on a rough bench seat amidships. The air smelt of hot water. Right. Ern pulled a lever. The spinning paddles hit the water, there was a jerk, and the boat moved forward. What's the name of this vessel? said Didactylus. It's a boat, a thing of the nature of things. It doesn't need a name. The boat chugged out of the boathouse and into the dark harbour. The paddles churned. No wind, no rowers, said Simony. 
Do you even begin to understand what you have here, Ern? The things you could do with this power. It could drag Omnia kicking and screaming into the centre of the fruit bat. The copper ball spun madly over the fire. It gleamed almost as brightly as Simone's eyes. Baratha tapped him on the shoulder. Can I have my tortoise? There's good eating on one of these things, Simone said, fishing out Om. There was no sound but the slosh of water against the unnamed boat's hull and the spinning of the philosophical engine. There's some exiles in Ankh, said Simone. Don't worry, you'll be safe there. Baratha lowered his voice to a whisper. What sort of place is Ankh? A city of a million souls, many of them occupying bodies, and a thousand religions. There's even a temple to the small gods. Not a bad place for a fresh start. With my brains and your... Well, with my brains, we should soon be in business again. Vorbis stirred the ashes with his foot. No bones. The soldier stood silently. The fluffy grey flakes collapsed and blew a little way in the dawn breeze. And the wrong sort of ash. Be assured, I know that of which I speak. He wandered over to the charred trap door and prodded it with his toe. We uh, followed the tunnel, said the sergeant. It comes out near the docks. They're not in the city. We have searched it fully, Lord. Then they left by sea. Let us get down to the docks. Urn prodded at the copper globe with a piece of wire while the unnamed boat wallowed in the waves. The nozzles are bonged up. When the water rushes out of the globe, it leaves salt behind. Why? said Simony. Water likes to travel light. We'll be calmed. Can you do anything about it? Yes, wait for it to cool down, clean it out and put some more water in it. But we're still in sight of the coast. You might be, said Didactylus. Baratha lay in the pointed end, looking down at the water. A small squid siphoned past, just under the surface. He wondered what it was, and knew it was the common bottle squid of the class Cephalopoda phyla mollusca, and that it had an internal carilaginous support instead of a skeleton. Simony and Urn were bent over the philosophical engine. Baratha stared at the globe. A sphere of radius r, which therefore had a volume v equals 4 stroke 3 pi r r r, and surface area a equals 4 pi r r minus. Oh, my God. Baratha sagged to his knees in the rocking boat. The books are leaking. I don't see how that can happen, said Didactylus. You didn't read them. You don't know what they mean. They know what they mean. What's the matter with him, said Simony. He thinks he knows too much. Huh, <laughs> priests. Mad, the lot of them. Sit down, boy, said Didactylus. You're making the boat rock. We're overloaded as it is. We're ready to start again, Ern said. Just bail some water in here with your helmet, mister. And then we shall go again? Well, we can start getting up steam. He blew on the fire. Nine-tenths of Om dozed in his shell. The rest of him drifted like a fog in the real world of the gods. He thought, We're a little boat. There's the whole of the ocean. She'll probably not even notice us. Greetings, said the Queen of the Sea. Ah, I see you're still managing to exist, little tortoise. Hanging in there? There was a pause. I expect, said Om guardedly, you are looking for your price. This vessel and everyone in it. But your believer can be saved, as is the custom. What good are they to you? I mean, they've done nothing to deserve it. Deserve? They're human. What's deserve got to do with it? Om had to concede this. He wasn't thinking like a god. You've been relying on one human for too long, little god. I know, I know. Take the boat then, if you must. Om let himself retreat into the shell of his shell. Baratha? Yes? Can you swim? There, Ern said. Soon be on our way. We'd better be, said Simony. There's a ship out there. Baratha looked across the bay. A sleek, omnian ship was passing the lighthouse. It's moving fast, said Simony. I don't understand it. There's no wind. Ern looked round at the flat calm. 
There can't be wind there and not here. I said, can you swim? The voice was insistent in Brother's head. I don't know. Do you think you can find out quickly? Ern looked upwards. Clouds had massed over the unnamed boat. They were visibly spinning. What do you call it, Ern began, when you've got a dead calm surrounded by winds? Hurricane, said Didactylus. Lightning crackled between sky and sea. Ern yanked at the lever that lowered the screw into the water. Lightning struck a few yards away. Secondary lightning sparked off the spinning globe. We're in a boat with a large copper ball in the middle of a body of salt water, said Didactylus. Thanks, Ern. The sea surged up. Jump into the water, Om shouted. Why? A wave almost overturned the boat. Rain hissed on the surface of the sphere, sending up a scalding spray. Jump overboard! Trust me! Brother stood up, holding the sphere's framework to steady himself. Sit down, said Ern. I'm just going out. I may be some time. The boat rocked as he half jumped, half fell into the boiling sea. Lightning struck the sphere. As Baratha bobbed to the surface, he saw the globe glowing white hot and the unnamed boat, its screw almost out of the water, skimming away like a comet. It vanished in cloud and rain. A moment later, there was a muffled boom. Baratha raised his hand. Om broke the surface, blowing seawater out of his nostrils. Hold me out of the water! Tortoises can't swim! A wave submerged Baratha. For a moment the world was a dark green curtain ringing in his ears. Om! he shouted as he broke surface again. Yes! I don't think I can swim! The Sea Queen moved deep below the storm-tossed waves. The little boat had been a tempting target, she thought. But here was a bigger one, full of people sailing right into the storm. The Sea Queen had the attention span of an onion bargee. The fin of God plunged from wave crest to wave trough, the gale tearing at its sails. The captain fought his way through waist-high water to the prow, where Vorbis stood clutching the rail. Sir, we must reef sail! We can't outrun this! Green fire crackled on the tops of the masts. Vorbis turned. The light was reflected in the pit of his eyes. It is all for the glory of Om. Trust is our sail, and glory is our destination. The captain had had enough. The ocean floor is our destination! Vorbis shrugged. I did not say there would not be stops along the way. Lightning struck the mainmast. There was a scream as a mass of torn sail and rigging crashed onto the deck. The captain half swam, half climbed up the ladder to the wheel, where the helmsman was a shadow in the spray. We'll never make it alive! Correct. The hull hit a submerged rock and ripped open. Balks of timber splintered and fountained up into the whirling sky. And there was a sudden velvety silence. The captain found that he had acquired a recent memory. It involved water and a ringing in his ears and the sensation of cold fire in his lungs, but it was fading. He walked over to the rail, which was greyish and slightly transparent, and looked over the side. Um, we appear to have run out of sea. Yes. And land, too. Yes. The memory of Finn of God sailed on through the silence. The captain stared down. The crew was assembling on deck, looking up at him with anxious eyes. In front of the crew, the ship's rats had assembled. There was a tiny, robed shape in front of them. It said, Squeak! Seagulls never ventured this far along the desert coast. Their niche was filled by the scalby. The scalby looked like other birds after an oil slick. Scalbies ate things that made a vulture sick. Scalbies would eat vulture sick. One of them, on this bright new morning, came across a mound lying on the tide line and gave it a tentative jab with its beak. The mound groaned. The scalby backed away hurriedly. 
and turned its attention to a small domed rock beside the mound. The rock said, Back her off, you evil sod. The scalby made a kind of running jump onto a pile of sun-bleached driftwood. Things were looking up. If this rock was alive, then eventually it would be dead. The great god Om staggered over to Baratha and butted him in the head. Rise and shine, lad. Hup, hup, hup. All ashore, who's going ashore? Baratha opened an eye. What happened? You're alive, is what happened. Baratha pulled himself into a kneeling position. The beach was a barren hem where the land met the ocean. The air buzzed with unpleasant small insects. Oh, God, is, uh, is there any water to drink? Shouldn't think so. Baratha looked at the desert. Behind the driftwood, the dunes marched away. Which, which way is Omnia? We don't want to go to Omnia. Baratha picked the tortoise up. I think it's this way. What do you want to go to Omnia for? I don't, but I'm going anyway. It was still hot. The lifeless sea seemed to steam. Baratha trudged along in the vibrating haze. Even Om had stopped complaining. It was too hot. Here and there, fragments of wood rolled in the scum at the edge of the sea. Ahead, the air shimmered over the sand. In the middle of it was a dark blob. Baratha regarded it dispassionately as he approached. Closer to it turned out to be Vorbis. The thought took a long time to seep through Baratha's mind. Vorbis. Not with a robe, all torn off. Just his singlet with the nails sewn in. Blood all over one leg, torn by rock. Vorbis. Vorbis. On the high tide line, a scalby gave a croak. He's still alive. Betty. We should do something. Find a rock and stove his head in. We can't just leave him here. Baratha got his hand under the deacon and tried to lift him. To his dull surprise, Vorbis weighed almost nothing. The deacon's robe had concealed a body that was just skin stretched over bone. Baratha slung him over his shoulder. What are you going to do with him? Take him to Omnia. People must know what he did. You're mad! You're going to carry him to Omnia? Going to try. The sun set fast. It was better travelling at night with Vorbis over one shoulder and Om under one arm. At this time of year, Baratha knew things now. They were leaking into his head. The glow in the sky over there is the Aurora Coriolis, the hub lights. So keep the hub lights on the left and the sunset glow behind you. Did you ever go to Cori Celesti? Om, who had been nodding off in the cold, woke up with a start. <coughs> it's where the gods live. <laughs> I could tell you stories. What? think they're so bloody elite. You didn't live up there, then? No, got to be a thunder god or something. Got to have a whole parcel of worshippers to live on Knob Hill. I never did thundering. Bloody, I've got a big hammer. Blind Yo does all the thundering. You said there were hundreds of thunder gods. Yeah, and he's all of them. Rationalisation. A couple of tribes join up. They've both got thunder gods right. The gods kind of run together. I still don't see how one god can be a hundred thunder gods. They all look different. False noses. What? And different voices. I happen to know Eo's got 70 different hammers. Not common knowledge, that. And it's just the same with mother goddesses. There's only one of them. She's just got a lot of wigs, and it's amazing what you can do with a padded bra. There was absolute silence in the desert. The stars were tiny, motionless rosettes. Brother put Om down and laid Vorbis on the sand. Absolute silence. He heard Om say, People gotta believe in something. Might as well be gods. What else is there? Brother laughed. You know, I don't think I believe in anything anymore. Except me. Oh, I know you exist. He felt Om relax a little. Tortoises I can believe in. They seem to have a lot of existence in one place. It's gods in general I'm having difficulty with. 
A green glow in the sky indicated that the light of dawn was chasing frantically after its sun. Vorbis groaned. I don't know why he won't wake up. In the rapidly growing light, Baratha saw a rock island a little way off. Caves? Snakes. Poisonous snakes? Guess. The unnamed boat clipped along gently, the wind filling Urn's robe attached to a mast made out of bits of the sphere's framework bound together with Simony's sandal thongs. I think I know what went wrong, said Urn. A mere overspeed problem. Overspeed? We left the water, said Simony. It needs some sort of governor device. I think I could do something with a pair of revolving balls. It's funny you should say that, said Didactylus. When the sphere exploded, I distinctly felt my... That bloody thing nearly killed us, said Simony. A few flying fish zipped out of the waves, pursued by a dolphin. Can't help feeling sorry for that brother. Priests are expendable. Anyway, he was mad. I saw him whispering to that tortoise. I wish we still had it. There's good eating on one of those things. It wasn't much of a cave, just a deep hollow carved by the endless desert winds, but it was enough. Brother knelt on the stony floor and raised the rock over his head. He had to do it. I'm sorry, he said, and brought the rock down. In its early morning torpor, the snake was too slow to dodge. The cracking noise was a sound that Baratha knew his conscience would replay to him over and over again. Good, said Om. Now skin it and don't waste the juice. Baratha smashed the rock on the cave wall to create a crude cutting edge and gingerly started dismembering the snake. The unnamed boat bobbed in a gully between the rocks. There was a low cliff beyond the beach. I know this area, Simony said. We're a few miles from the village where a friend lives. All we have to do is wait till nightfall. Why are you doing this? said Ern. I mean, what's the point? Have you ever heard of a country called Estancia? Omnia conquered it 15 years ago, said Didactylus. That's right, my country. I was just a kid, but I won't forget, nor will others. There's a lot of people with a reason to hate the church. I saw you standing close to Vorbis, said Ern. I thought you were protecting him. Oh, I was. I was. I don't want anyone to kill him before I do. The sun was riveted to the copper dome of the sky. Baratha dozed in the cave. In his own corner, Vorbis tossed and turned. Om sat waiting in the cave mouth. And they came from under scraps of stone and from cracks in the rock. They fountained up from the sand. The air was filled with their voices, as faint as the whispering of gnats. It was hardly language at all. It was a mere modulation of desires and hungers. Want, Om replied. Mine. He was stronger. He had a believer. But they filled the sky like locusts. Want. Mine. The chittering became a whine. You can have the other one, said Om. Hard, shut in. I know, but this one, mine! The psychic shout echoed around the desert. The small gods fled. Except for one. It had not been swarming with the others. It had said nothing. Who are you? said Om. The small god stirred. There was a city once. It talked as though every word had been winched from the pit of memory. I, I, I remember there was a lake. I recall, I, I, and there were temples, such temples as you may dream of. Great pyramid temples that reached to the sky. Thousands were sacrificed to the greater glory. Om felt sick. This was a small god who hadn't always been small. And there were temples. I, I, me. Temples, great pyramid temples. Thousands sacrificed me to the greater glory. Me, 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 greater glory. Such glory. Temples, great pyramids, dream temples. Me, me, sacrificed. Dream. You were their god. Thousands were sacrificed. Can you hear me? Greater glory. 
Bee, bee, bee. What was your name? <sighs> name. A hot wind blew over the desert. Who were you? There was no answer. That's what happens, Om thought. Being a small god was bad, but how much worse to have been a god and to now be no more than a smoky bundle of memories blown back and forth across the sand. There were said to be oases in the desert, but they were never in the same place twice. The desert wasn't mappable. It ate map makers. Uh, so did the lions. Lions. Oh, dear. He had to find lions. Lions drank. Baratha awoke. His mouth tasted of snake. Om was butting him on the foot. Come on, come on. Is there any water? Five miles off. How do you know? I can sense it. Trust me. Come on, while there's some twilight. And don't forget Mr Vorbis. Vorbis stood up like a man asleep when Baratha helped him. Bring him along. Bring him along. Oh, yes. Good old Vorbis. Simony and the two philosophers stood on the cliff top, looking across the parched farmlands of Omnia to the distant rock of the citadel. Looks big, said Ern. See the gleam, said Simony. Those are the doors. Look massive. I was wondering about the boat. Something like that could smash the doors, right? You'd have to flood the valley. I mean, if it was on wheels. If I had a forge and half a dozen blacksmiths. No problem. The sun was on the horizon when Baratha, his arm around Vorbis's shoulders, reached the next rock island. It was bigger than the one with the snake. There were even plants lodging in crevices in the rocks. There's water somewhere, said Baratha, and I can smell something, something rank. His foot kicked against something yellow-white, which bounced away among the rocks, making a noise like a sack full of coconuts. What was that? Definitely not a skull, lied Om. There's bones everywhere. Brother picked one up. He was, as he well knew, stupid, but people didn't gnaw their own bones after they died. Om. There's water here, we need it. But there's probably one or two drawbacks. What drawbacks? Well, you know, lions. There's lions here? Only one. Only one? It won't take any notice of us. Once it's fed, they go to sleep. After feeding. Brother looked round at Vorbis, who was slumped against a rock. You want to use him as bait? He'll be dying for a good cause. A good cause? I like it. There was a growl from the rock pile and the lion emerged slowly. Its mane was matted. Ancient scars crisscrossed its pelt. It dragged itself towards Baratha, back legs trailing uselessly. It's hurt. Oh, good. And there's plenty of eating on one of those. A bit stringy, but... The lion collapsed, its toast-racked chest heaving. A spear was protruding from its flank. Flies flew up in a swarm. We can't just leave it. We can. It's a lion. You leave lions alone. Baratha knelt down and grasped the spear haft. The lion grunted as he withdrew the head. Omnion. It must have met the soldiers when they were on the way to Ephebe. He tore a strip from his robe and tried to clean the wound. We want to eat it, not cure it. What are you thinking of? It wanted to be helped. And soon it will want to be fed. Baratha gazed at the rock pile. The boulders formed a maze of half-open tunnels and caves. By the smell, the lion had lived there for a long time and had quite often been ill. What's so fascinating about a lion's den? It's got steps down into it. Didactylus could feel the crowd. It filled the barn. How many are there? Hundreds, said Ern. And, uh, Master? Yes? There's even one or two priests and dozens of soldiers. Don't worry, said Simony. They are turtle believers, just like you. But I don't... They're just waiting for someone to lead them. Didactylus turned his face to the crowd. He could feel the hot, hushed silence of their stares. 
There were no whispering voices here. Even the small gods kept away from abandoned temples, for the same reason that people kept away from graveyards. The only sound was the occasional plink of the water. Each drop took minutes. It was hypnotic. Baratha found himself staring at each developing drip. How? said Om. Water seeps down after the rains. It lodges in the rocks. It dripped into a shallow pool in front of what looked like an altar. There were a few statues, all of them toppled. I want to get out of here, said Om. Why? There's water, and it's cool. Because a god lived here. I can feel it. A great god. And now no one even knows his name. This place is a morgue. Now do you understand? No. Don't you fear death? You're a human. Do you know what it's like being human? Easy. Get born, do what you're told, die, forget. Baratha stared at him. Is something wrong? Baratha shook his head and walked over to Vorbis. The deacon's body was present, but the whereabouts of his mind was probably not locatable on any normal atlas. It was just that suddenly Baratha felt so alone that even Vorbis was good company. Why worry about him? Om said. In a hundred years he'll be dead anyway. We'll all be dead. What? I said in a hundred years' time we'll all be dead. Baratha stared. Yes, we will, but here and now we are alive. He picked up Om. And we'll make it home, all of us. It is written, is it? It is said. Didactylus smiled. He'd spoken many times to crowds in Ephebe, but this crowd put him in mind of Baratha. He was talking in philosophy, but they were listening in gibberish. You can't believe in Great Atuin, he said. Great Atuin exists. There's no point in believing in things that exist. They just are, he sighed. What do you want to hear? The turtle moves. Empires grow and crumble, and the turtle moves. Gods come and go, and still the turtle moves. From the darkness came a voice. And that is really true? Didactylus shrugged. It's real. I don't know about truth. And I don't think the turtle gives a bugger whether it's true or not to tell you the truth. Simony pulled Urn to one side. This isn't what they came to hear. They don't want philosophy. They want a reason to move against the church, and he's muffed it. You can't inspire people with facts. They need a cause. They need a symbol. They left the temple just before sundown. The lion had crawled into the shade of some rocks. It'll track us, moaned Om. They do that for miles and miles. We'll survive. I walk with my god. And half an hour later, a black shadowy line on the silver moonlit desert. There were the tracks. The soldiers came this way. We just have to follow the tracks back. If we head where they've come from, we'll get where we're going. Baratha glanced at Vorbis. He was walking unaided now, provided that you turned him whenever you needed to change direction. And even Om had to admit that the tracks were some comfort. The sun was up. Already the rocks were warm to the touch. Get some rest, said Om. I'll keep watch. There were snakes and lizards on the rock islands. They were probably very nourishing, and every one was, in its own way, a taste explosion. There was no more water. But there were plants, more or less. They looked like groups of stones, except where a few had put up a central flower spike that was a brilliant pink and purple in the dawn light. Where do they get water from? Fossil seas. Water that's turned to stone? No, nope. water that sank down thousands of years ago, right down in the bedrock. Baratha led Vorbis into the shade of a large boulder and gently pushed him down. Then he lay down too. The thirst wasn't too bad yet. Later on they might find a snake. He tried to sleep and heard Om's voice in his head. Mine! Go away! No! Mine! and there was another sound, a sort of gnat-like whining and promises in his head. They flashed past, 
faces talking to him, shapes taking him high above the world, visions of greatness. All this was his. He could do anything. All he had to do was believe. In me, in me, in me. An image formed in front of him. There, on a stone, was a roast pig surrounded by fruit and a mug of beer so cold the air was frosting on the sides. Mine! Baratha blinked. The voices faded. So did the food. He blinked again. They don't know what to offer you, said Om's voice quietly. So they try to offer you anything. Generally, they start with visions of food and carnal gratification. They got as far as the food. Good job I overcame them, then. Baratha raised himself on his elbows. The shadows were long. How long were they trying? All day, persistent devils, thick as flies. Baratha learnt why at sunset. He met St Ungulant, the anchorite, friend of all small gods, everywhere. Well, 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 said St Ungulant. We don't get very many visitors up here. Isn't that so, Angus? He addressed the air beside him. Baratha was trying to keep his balance because the cartwheel rocked dangerously every time he moved. The wheel had been nailed flat on top of a slim pole. It was just wide enough for one person to lie uncomfortably. But St Ungulant looked designed to lie uncomfortably. He was so thin that even skeletons would say, Whew, isn't he thin? There was a slightly smaller pole a few feet away, with an old-fashioned half-moon cut out on the door privy on it. I was thinking of adding another wheel over there. Angus says we ought to have a patio. He could barbecue on it, said Om inside Baratha's head. Um, said Baratha, what religion are you a saint of, exactly? None, really. My parents named me Severian Thaddeus Ungulant, and then one day someone drew attention to the initials. After that, it all seemed rather inevitable. The wheel rocked slightly. St Ungulant's skin was almost blackened by the desert sun. I've had to pick up herming as I went along. I'm self-taught. You can't find a hermit to teach you herming. But there's Angus. My word, I'd have gone quite mad if it wasn't for Angus cheering me up. Baratha smiled at the empty air. Actually, it's a pretty good life. The food and drink are extremely worthwhile. Baratha had a feeling he knew what was coming next. Beer cold enough? Extremely frosty. And the roast pig? All brown and crunchy round the edges. And mushrooms too, said Om. Any mushrooms in these parts? St Ungulant nodded happily. After the annual rains, yes, red ones with yellow spots. The desert becomes really interesting after the mushroom season. Full of giant purple singing slugs? Exploding giraffes? Yes, I think they're attracted by the mushrooms. You're catching on, kid, said Om. And I expect sometimes you drink water. Odd, isn't it, when ice-cold beer is so readily available? Where do you get it? The water? You know the stone plants? The ones with the big flowers? If you cut open the fleshy parts of the leaves, there's up to half a pint. It tastes like wee-wee, mind you. I think... We could put up with that, said Baratha through dry lips. He backed towards the rope ladder that was the saint's contact with the ground. Are you sure you won't stay? It's Wednesday. We get sucking pig plus chef's selection of sun-drenched dew-fresh vegetables. We... we have lots to do. Sweets from the trolley? St Ungulant looked down sadly as Baratha helped Vorbis away across the wilderness. And afterwards there's mints. No? Soon the figures were mere dots on the sand. St Ungulant smiled. All the more for us, eh, Angus? Yes, said Angus. The fighting was over in Ephebe. It hadn't lasted long. There were too many narrow streets, too many ambushes, and Vorbis had gone. The tyrant spent his first day of freedom composing messages to the other small countries along the coast. It was time to do something about Omnia. Baratha sang. His voice echoed off the rocks. You could live in the desert, or at least survive. Getting back to Omnia could only be a matter of time. One more day. When the sun was starting to climb, they found shade again. There were bushes here. 
slow-growing, spiky, every tiny leaf barricaded behind its crown of thorns. Om could eat. He crawled through the bushes, found a couple of leaves, and watched the sleepers. He saw Vorbis sit up, look around him in a slow, methodical way, pick up a stone, study it carefully, and then bring it down sharply on Baratha's head. Then he picked Baratha up, slung him across his shoulders, and set off towards Omnia. Om started to move forward as Vorbis disappeared round some rocks. Then he ducked into his shell as a shadow skimmed over the ground. It was a familiar shadow. A breeze stirred the sand, and Om thought he could hear the taunting, mocking voices of all the small gods. The first thing he saw was the light slanting through a window. Against the light was a pair of hands raised in the sign of the holy thorns. Brother Numrod? The master of novices looked up. Baratha. Yes? Om be praised. How do you feel? His head ached. His back felt as though it was on fire. You were very badly sunburned, and that was a nasty knock on the head you had in the fall. What fall? From the rocks in the desert. You were with the prophet. You walked with the prophet, one of my novices. But I don't remember any prophet. There was just me and... Vorbis? Nomrod was beaming. I was privileged to be in the place of lamentation when he arrived, covered in dust and leading a donkey. You were across the back. I don't remember a donkey. He'd picked it up at one of the farms. There was quite a crowd with him. Forbis is the eighth prophet. Of course. He's declared a month of Jahadra and double penances. The Snobiarch has gone off to the hermitage at Scant. How long since we came back? Almost a week. A week? And he left orders that you were to be brought to him as soon as you were fully conscious. He was very definite about that. In the centre of the citadel, behind the temple, was a walled garden. Vorbis was there, surrounded by bishops and iams. Ah, my desert companion he said as Baratha approached. My brothers, I should like you to know that I have it in my mind to raise our Baratha to archbishophood. There was a very faint murmur of astonishment from the clerics. And now you will all leave, but Archbishop Baratha will remain. We wish to talk. The clergy withdrew. Vorbis sat on a stone chair under an elder tree and gave Baratha a long, slow stare. You are recovered? Yes, Lord. There was a long silence. Overhead, an eagle circled. I am sure you have confused memories of our wanderings in the wilderness. No, my memory does not confuse readily. Numrod said you led me through the desert. Remember what I said about fundamental truth, Baratha? Om guided my steps. My God led me, and I led you. I see. Overhead, the eagle appeared to hang motionless in the air for a moment. Then it folded its wings and fell. Much was given to me in the desert, Baratha. Now I must tell the world that is the duty of a prophet. It sometimes took a long time for an idea to form in Baratha's mind, but one was forming now. It was something about the way Vorbis was sitting, the edge in his voice. Vorbis was afraid of him. Somewhere out on the hillsides, the eagle swooped, picked something up, and strove for height. I have something to show you that may amuse you, Vorbis said, standing up. Steps led from the garden to the maze of underground tunnels and rooms that underlay the temple. Baratha followed Vorbis to the artificer's quarters, where workshops glowed red with the light of the forge fires. Several workers were clustered around something wide and curved. There. What do you think? It was a turtle. The iron founders had done a pretty good job, even down to the patterning on the shell and the scales on the legs. It was about eight feet long. 
They think they live on the back of a great turtle, do they not? Well, let them die on one. Now Baratha could see the shackles attached to each iron leg. He bent down. Yes, there was the firebox underneath. That much iron would take ages to heat up to the point of pain. Some aspects of quisition thinking never changed. And he would forge a book of Vorbis, and Baratha knew what the commandments would be, holy wars and blood and crusades and blood and piety and blood. Some spotty boy was hoeing the vegetable garden. He looked in amazement when Baratha took the hoe. You aren't doing it right. Go and do something else. Baratha jabbed viciously at the weeds around the seedlings. Only a few weeks and already there was a haze of green on the soil. He worked his way along to the end of the row. Then he tidied up the bean vines. Lutze watched carefully from his little shed by the soil heaps. It was another barn. Ern was seeing a lot of barns. They'd started with a cart, and the gearing had been a problem. I can't get it to go backwards, he said. Don't worry, said Simony. It won't have to go backwards. What about armour? This thing is 20 feet long. I've tried nailing iron plates on a framework, but it just collapses under the weight. Simony looked at the skeleton of the steam car. Ever been in a battle? No, I've got flat feet. Do you know what a tortoise is? OK, the answer isn't a reptile in a shell, is it? I mean, a shield tortoise. When you're attacking a fortress and the enemy is dropping everything he's got on you, every man holds his shield overhead so that it kind of slots into all the shields around it. can take a lot of weight. Overlapping, like scales. Ern looked reflectively at the cart. And the battering ram? Oh, that's no problem. Tree trunk bolted to the frame. Excuse me, sirs. A burly man stepped forward. Yes, Sergeant Fergman? The bronze doors is reinforced with Latian steel and they opens outwards only. If you push on them, they only locks more firmly together. How are they open then? said Ern. The Cenobiarch raises his hand and the breath of God blows them open. In a logical sense, I meant. Oh, well, one of the deacons goes behind a curtain and pulls a lever, but... When I was a guard down in the crypts, sometimes you could hear water gushing. Hydraulics. Can uh, you get in? said Simony. To the room? Why not? Could Fergman make these hydraulics work? Ern was rubbing his chin reflectively with a hammer. Hmm, shouldn't think so. Could you? Probably. Ern was still staring thoughtfully at the steam cart. How soon can you have it all finished? Uh, late tomorrow night? If we work through tonight, we'll need it for the next dawn. We won't have time to see if it works. It'll work first time. Really? I built it. It'll work first time. Good. Ern was left alone in the barn. Just don't ask me about the second or third time, he said quietly to himself. Vorbis sat in the stone chair in his garden. There will be... A disturbance during the ceremony tomorrow. Lord, said one of the head inquisitors, I have special knowledge. Of course, Lord. You know the breaking strain of sinews and muscles, Deacon Cusp? Yes, Lord. I know the breaking strain of people. It was night. Lutze crept through the gloom of the barn, sweeping industriously. Then he took a rag from the recesses of his robe and polished the outside of the moving turtle which loomed low and menacing in the shadows. And he swept his way towards the forge. Ern, who was almost asleep on his feet, grunted as something was put in his hands. It was a cup of tea. Oh, thank you. Nod, smile. Nearly done. Just got to let it cool now, really slowly. Otherwise, it crystallises, you see. Nod, smile, nod. It was good tea. It's not an mm, important cast anyway, said Ern, swaying. Just the control levers. Lutze caught him carefully and steered him to a seat on a heap of charcoal. Then he went and watched the forge for a while. The bar of steel was glowing in the mould. He poured a bucket of cold water over it, put his broom over his shoulder and ran away. 
People would have been surprised at his turn of speed, especially in a man 6,000 years old who ate nothing but brown rice and drank only green tea with a knob of rancid butter in it. You call this philosophy, roared Didactylus, his stick wanged down on the moving turtle's flanks. Philosophy is supposed to make life better. This will make it better. It'll help overthrow a tyrant. And then? And then what? And then you'll smash it up, burn the plans, yes? Well, aha. What if we do keep it? It'll be uh, a deterrent to other tyrants. You think tyrants won't build them too? Well, I can build bigger ones. Didactylus sagged. Yes, so that's all right then. He looked hunched up and suddenly old. The great god Om slid down the side of an irrigation ditch. He estimated that he was doing less than a fifth of a mile an hour and the citadel was at least 20 miles away. And then there was nightfall. He'd slow down at night as his blood cooled. He was losing heat already. Heat meant speed. He saw the eagle forever circling. He pulled himself up onto an ant hill. You're going to die. You're going to die. Preparations for the inauguration of the Cenobiarch Prophet began many hours before the dawn. Firstly, there was a very careful search of the temple. Although it was against the thread, Deacon Cusp had his head screwed on. He knew what a well-placed arrow would do to an unexpecting stomach. Someone tapped him on the ribcage. He reached instinctively for his dagger. Oh. Lutze indicated with his broom that Deacon Cusp was standing on a patch of floor that he wished to sweep. Hello, you ghastly little yellow fool. Nod, smile. Idiot! Smile, smile. Watch. Urn stood back. Tell me again. We stoke up the firebox, said Simony. When the red needle points to XXV1, turn the brass tap. When the bronze whistle blows, pull the big lever and steer by pulling the ropes. They'd had time to put a few finishing touches to the moving turtle. There were serrated edges to the shell and spikes on the wheels. Right, said Urn. Give us an hour, then. You should get to the temple by the time we get the doors open. Baratha wandered through the deserted corridors of the novices section. There were dozens of ceremonies to be undertaken before the new Cenobiarch was crowned. He never felt more alone. The wilderness had been a feast of fun compared to this. Life was so much simpler in the desert. He wandered out into the outside world and stared gloomily at the ground. If Om was alive, surely he could send a sign. And then he thought, Om's gone, and soon the world will end. I might as well watch it happen. Sandals flapping, Baratha set off towards the place. You god-awful idiot! Don't go that way! The sun was well up now, a golden ball in a flaming orange sky. Om pulled himself up another slope and stared blearily at the distant citadel. In his mind's eye, he could hear the mocking voices of all small gods. They didn't like a god who had failed. It reminded them of mortality. He'd be thrust out into the deep desert until the end of the world. Urn and Fergman walked nonchalantly through the tunnels of the citadel. The only people around were those with vital jobs to do. Fergman turned a corner and stopped by a large grill which stretched from floor to ceiling. It was very rusty. Urn peered through the bars. Beyond, in the gloom, there were pipes. Eureka! Going for a bath, then? said Fergman. Just keep watch. Urn selected a short crowbar from his belt and inserted it between the grill and the stonework. The grill popped out with a leaden sound. He stepped inside the long, dark, damp room and gave a whistle of admiration. He looked up at iron buckets bigger than he was and a tangle of man-sized pipes. This was the breath of God. Probably the last man who knew how it worked had been tortured to death years before. Killing the creator was a traditional method of patent protection. There were the levers, and there, hanging over pits in the rock floor, were the two sets of counterweights. Probably it would only take a few hundred gallons of water to swing the balance either way. Simple principle, said Urn. No gods are involved in any way. 
Water pours into the reservoirs, disturbing the equilibrium. One lot of weight descends and the other rises up. The weight at the door is immaterial, he caught Fergman's expression. Water goes in and out and the doors swing open. What did Simony say the sign would be? They'll blow a trumpet when they're through the main gate. Right. Urn eyed the weights and the reservoirs overhead. The bronze pipes dripped with corrosion. Just give me a leg up, will you? It'll take time to unhook the linkage to the valve. Urn heaved himself into the ancient machinery, while above in the temple, the ceremony droned on. There never was a book of the prophet Baratha, but an enterprising scribe, during what came to be called the renovation, did assemble some notes. This was the testament of Catmion Handoff de Ibla. One, I was standing right by the statue of Osory Wright when I noticed Baratha just beside me. Two, I said to him, hello, your graciousness, and offered him a yoghurt practically free. Three, he responded no. Four, I said, it's a live yoghurt. Five, he said, yes, he could see. Six, right, I admit it was more alive than usual. I mean, I had to keep hitting it with a spoon to stop it getting out of the... All right. He was staring at the doors. This was about the time of the third gong. Seven, he just stood there staring. So I said, got a problem, your reverence? Upon which he vouchsafed, I cannot hear him. I said, what is this he to whom what you refer? He said, if he was here, he would send me a sign. Eight, anyway, then he pushed through the line of guards and stood right in front of the doors. I heard him say, I carried you in the desert. I believed all my life, just give me this one thing. Nine, something like that anyway. Baratha's mind was flaming like a beacon in Om's senses. It's too soon, he yelled. You need followers. You can't do it by yourself. Simony turned to look down the length of the turtle. Thirty men were crouched under the shell. The brass whistle whistled. Simony picked up the steering ropes. Stand by. He pulled the big lever hard. The brittle metal snapped in his hand. In the depths of the temple's hidden plumbing, Urn grasped a bronze pipe firmly with his spanner and gave the nut a cautious turn. It resisted. He used more pressure. With a sad little metal sound, the pipe twisted and broke. Water gushed out, hitting him in the face. He tried to block the flow with his fingers, but it spurted around his hands and gurgled down a channel towards one of the weights. Stop it! Stop it! he shouted. What? said Fergman. Stop the water! How? Both of you, stand still. There was a heavy-set man in a black robe standing in the doorway. Behind him a guard held a sword in a meaningful manner. Who are you? Why are you here? Urn gestured with his spanner. Well, it's the seating, isn't it? he said. You got shocking seepage around the seating. Deacon Cusp stepped into the room. He glared uncertainly at Urn. But you're not. He spun around as Fergman hit the guard hard with a length of broken pipe. When he turned back, Urn's spanner caught him full in the stomach. He doubled up, sagged backwards, and grabbed at one of the weights for support. It sank down ponderously. He clawed higher. It sank further, dropping below the lip of the pit. Urn saw his face staring up at him as the weight fell into the gloom. Above them, linkage clanked into action. There was a distant creaking of bronze against bronze. And blows rained down on the unmoving, moving turtle's carapace. Damn, 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 shouted Simony. Move! I command you to move! The unmoving machine leaked steam and sat there. And Om pulled himself up the slope of a small hill. So it came to this then. There was only one way to get there now. It was a million to one chance. And Baratha stood in front of the huge doors. Just a sign, he thought, in the loneliness of his head. The doors trembled and swung slowly outwards. Baratha stepped forward. The thousands inside the temple were looking around in confusion. The choirs of lesser iams paused in their chant. Baratha walked on up the aisle. Vorbis was standing in the centre of the temple, under the vault of the dome. Guards hurried towards Baratha, but Vorbis raised a hand in a gentle but very positive movement which filled the temple with silence. Ah, my Baratha. 
We looked for you in vain. Baratha stopped a few feet away. The part of him still capable of thought was thinking, There is nothing you can say. It doesn't matter what you tell people about Ephebe and Brother Murdoch and the desert. No one will care. It won't be fundamentally true. The black-on-black -black eyes filled the world like two pits. There is something you wish to say? Baratha's mind gave up, and Baratha's body took over. It brought his hand back and raised it. He saw Vorbis turn his cheek and smile. Baratha lowered his hand. No, I won't. As the hands of the guards closed on him, Vorbis stepped forward, patted him on the shoulder. Thrash him within an inch of his life and burn him the rest of the way. Do it now. A world of silence. No sound except the rush of wind through feathers as the eagle drops like an arrow, the world spinning around the little moving shape that is the focus of all the eagle's attention. Closer and talons down, grip and rise. Baratha opened his eyes. He was spread-eagled on a surface, his arms and legs chained, sky above. The towering frontage of the temple to one side, by turning his head a little, he could see the silent crowd and the brown metal of the iron turtle. He could smell smoke. The world spun under Om as the eagle sought for shell-cracking height. Careful, careful, concentrate. It'll let go any second. Om stared at the body just above him, picked what he hoped was the right spot, plunged his beak through the brown feathers and gripped. The eagle blinked. No tortoise had ever done that to an eagle. Om's thoughts arrived in the little silvery world of its mind. We don't want to hurt one another, now do we? The eagle's eyes watered. Now, this is what I want you to do. Ern pushed his way through the crowd, with Fergmen trailing behind. The crowd was silent and very attentive. He craned forward to see and then looked up at the soldier beside him. It was Simony. I thought! It didn't work, but that doesn't matter now. The flat tones of his voice made Ern follow the eyes of the crowd. There was another iron turtle there, and chained to the back. Who's that? Baratha. What, alive? Come on, then! Come on what? We can rush the steps and save him. Simony grabbed his arm. Think logically, would you? Look at the crowd. Well, they don't like it. We can make Baratha's death a symbol for people. A symbol? Ern stared at the distant figure of Baratha. It was naked except for a loincloth. Now I know Vorbis is evil, he said, turning to Simony. He turns other people into copies of himself. Simony's grip was like a vice. You're saying I'm like him? You're thinking like him? So we rush them, then. He dies anyway and we die too. What difference does that make? Ern's face was grey. You mean you don't know? You don't know? The sky was blue. Baratha turned his head again towards the sun. It was eclipsed by the head of Vorbis. Hot yet, Baratha? Warm. It will get warmer. You are going to burn for treachery and heresy. There will be justice. If there is no justice, there is nothing. Baratha was aware of a small voice in his head, too faint yet to distinguish words. Justice! The idea seemed to enrage Vorbis. This is justice. Om has judged through me! There was a speck in the sun now, speeding towards the citadel. The little voice was saying, Left, 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 up, right, right a bit. The mass of metal under Baratha was getting uncomfortably hot. He comes now, he said. Om comes, let him come. Let him judge between us. Left now. One, two, three. Vorbis. What? You are going to die. It was hardly a whisper, but it carried across the place. The eagle sped across the square so low that people ducked. Then it cleared the roof of the temple 
and curved away towards the mountains. The watchers relaxed. No one saw the tiny speck tumbling from the sky. <coughs> Vorbis extended his arms and smiled beatifically at the sky. There was just time for his expression to change before two pounds of tortoise travelling at three metres a second hit him between the eyes. Baratha was aware of feet running up the steps and then a voice. One, he is mine. The great god rose over the temple, billowing and changing as the belief of thousands of people flowed into him. There were shapes of eagle-headed men and bulls and golden horns. Four bolts of fire whirred out of the cloud and burst the chains holding Baratha. Two, he is Sanobiarch and prophet of prophets. The cloud had by now condensed into a shimmering golden figure as tall as the temple. It leant down until its face was a few feet away from Baratha and in a whisper that boomed across the place said... Three, you and me, kid. This is just the start. People are going to find out what wailing and gnashing of teeth really is. Another shaft of flame shot out and struck the temple doors. They slammed shut and then the white-hot bronze melted, erasing the commandments of the centuries. Four... What shall it be, prophet? Brother stood up unsteadily. Ern supported him by one arm and Simony by the other. Hmm? Five, your commandments. I don't know if I can think of any, said Brother. The world waited. Not killing people. We could do with one like that, said someone from the crowd. It'd be a good start, said Ern. They looked. At the chosen one. No, not really. They stared at him. Come on, said Simony. What's wrong with it? It's, um, it's hard to explain, but I think you should do things because they're right, not because God say so. Six, I like one about not killing. Seven, hurry up. I've got some smiting to do. No, no smiting. No commandments unless you obey them too. Om thumped on the roof of the temple. Eight, you order me. Me? No, I ask. Nine, I do not need you. I have believers enough now. But... Only through me, and perhaps not for long. It's happened before, that's why gods die. They never believe in people, but you have a chance. All you need to do is believe. It could be a bargain. Ten? Bargain? I don't bargain. Not with humans. Bargain now while you have the chance. Om paused, then he said, Eleven. You want a constitutional religion? Why not? The other sort didn't work. Om lent on the temple. Chapter 2, verse 1. Very well then, but only for a time. A grin spread across the enormous smoking face. For one hundred years. And after a hundred years? Two, we shall see. Agreed. A finger the length of a tree descended, touched Baratha. Three. You have a persuasive way. You will need it. A fleet approaches. Ephebians, said Simony. Four, and Sortians, and the Jellybabians, and Clatchians, every free country along the coast to stamp out Omnia. For good. Simony looked up at the god. Will you help? No, help, said Baratha firmly. What? We'll need a mighty army against that lot. And we haven't got one, so we'll do it another way. Baratha's calmness was like a desert. He looked up at Om. 
You will not show yourself like this again? Chapter 3, verse 1. No, once is enough. Remember the desert? Two, I will remember. Walk with me. Baratha went over to the body of Vorbis and picked it up. He walked down the steps. Ern and Simony watched him go. He's going to die, said Simony. He turned to Om. Can you stop him? Three, it may be that I cannot. Well, we're not deserting him. Four, good. Om watched them go too. Ex uh, excuse me. Five, yes. Six, what is your name? Um, De Ibler, God. Seven, ah, yes. You could manage just a small commandment, uh, something about eating yoghurt on Wednesday, say. It's always difficult to shift midweek. Eight, you stand before your God and look for business opportunities. Well, strike while the iron is hot, as the Inquisitors say. <laughs> we could uh, come to an arrangement. Twenty percent? How about it? The great god Om smiled. Nine? I think you will make a little profit, Debla. Right. That's all I'm looking for. Just trying to make both ends humus. Ten? Tortoises are to be left alone. The shade of Vorbis looked around. The black sand was absolutely still under the starlit sky. It looked cold. Ah, the desert. There was a hint of uncertainty. The feeling was unfamiliar and terrifying. He got a grip on himself. And at the end of the desert? Judgment. Of course. Forbes tried to concentrate. He couldn't. He could feel certainty draining away, and he'd always been certain. He hesitated. He had to cross the desert. What could there be to fear? The desert was what you believed. Vorbis looked inside himself and went on looking. He sagged to his knees. Death snapped his fingers, and a large white horse trotted up. Don't leave me. It's... <laughs> It's so empty. Death gathered up the reins. You have perhaps heard the phrase that hell is other people. Yes. In time, you will learn that it is wrong. The first boats grounded in the shallows and the troops leapt into shoulder-high surf. General Argavisti of Ephebe scanned the beach. They must have seen us coming. So why would they let us establish a beachhead? Heat haze wavered over the dunes. A dot appeared, growing and contracting in the shimmering air. General Argavisti shaded his eyes. The figure stopped at the foot of the dunes. Fellows are just standing there. He's carrying something. Sergeant, take a couple of men and bring him here. Baratha was brought before a trestle table, behind which sat half a dozen large men in various military styles. He dropped Vorbis's body onto the sand. I know him, said Bavorius of Tsort. Vorbis. Someone killed him at last, eh? Who sent you, boy? said Argavisti. No one. You could say, I come from the future. Are you a philosopher? Where's your sponge? You've come to wage war on Omnia. This would not be a good idea. From Omnia's point of view, yes. From everyone's. You will probably defeat us, but not all of us. And there'll be another war, and one day people will say, why didn't they sort it all out before it started, on the beach? Now we have that chance. Argavisti stared at him. Are you talking about surrender? If that's the word. You can't do that! Someone will have to. Listen, Vorbis is dead. He's paid. We were not sent here to parley said Bavorius abruptly. Vorbis's death changes nothing fundamental. We are here to see that Omnia is no longer a threat. It is not. We will rebuild a Phoebe. We will reduce our army. Consider us beaten. We will even open Omnia to whatever religions wish to build holy places here. 
A voice echoed in his head. One. What? Two. Other gods? Will you please excuse me a moment, said Baratha brightly. I need to pray. He walked off a little way up the beach. Yes? Three. Other gods in Omnia? Ah, but it'll work for you. People will soon see that those other ones are no good. For you shall not subject your god to market forces. I'm sorry. I can see that you... His eye was caught by a movement among the dunes. Oh, no, the idiots! He turned and ran desperately towards the beached fleet. No, listen, listen! But they had seen the army too. It looked impressive, perhaps more impressive than it really was. In the lead... The iron cart. Steam poured out of its funnel. Stupid! Stupid! Baratha shouted to the world in general. The fleet was already forming battle lines, and Bavorius caught him as he plunged towards a line of spears. I see. Keep us talking while your soldiers get into position, eh? No! I didn't want that! Bavorius's eyes narrowed. No, but it doesn't matter. Fight first, talk after. That's how it works, boy. That's history. Now go back. The Omnians were assembling among the dunes. A lot of them had clustered around the iron-shielded cart. Didn't I say I'd go down there alone? Baratha said. Simony gave him a grim smile. Did it work? There was a clanging noise, and a hatch opened on the side of the turtle. Urn emerged backwards, holding a spanner. What is this thing? said Baratha. It's a machine for fighting said Simony. The turtle moves, eh? Baratha looked at the spiked wheels. It's a device that goes by itself, said Ern. What comes out of the big long spout thing at the front? Steam. Oh. Very hot. Huh? Scalding, in fact. Baratha's gaze drifted from the steam funnel to the rotating knives. Very philosophical. Simony broke the silence by patting Baratha on the shoulder. We won't lose, he said. We have God on our side. Baratha turned. His fist shot out. Simony clutched his chin. What was that for? We get the gods we deserve, and we don't deserve any. The sanest man I've met this year lives up a pole in the desert. I think I ought to join him. One. Why? Gods and men. Men and gods. Stupid. Two. But you are the chosen one. Choose someone else. Baratha strode off through the ragged army. No one tried to stop him. Something like a golden comet sped across the sky of the Discworld. Om soared like an eagle, buoyed up by the strength of belief. Belief this hot never lasted long. Human minds could not sustain it. But while it did last, he was strong. The central spire of Corrie Celeste rises up from the mountains at the hub, ten vertical miles of green ice and snow, topped by the turrets and domes of Dun Manifestin. There the gods of the disc world live. There was a double door at the end of the main hall. It burst inward, and Om strode through the debris. Right, he said. Io, god of thunder, looked up from his throne and waved his hammer threateningly. Who are you? Om strode towards the throne, picked up Io by his toga and gave a quick jab with his forehead. Oh, you didn't have to do that. Listen, friend, I've got no time for talking to some panty waster in a sheet. Where's the gods of Ephebe and Sort? Io clutching at his nose, waved vaguely towards the centre of the hall. In the middle of the room was what at first looked like a round table, and then looked like a model of the disc world, and then in some undefinable way looked like the real disc world, both a map and the place mapped. The gods clustered around it, watching intently. Om elbowed aside a minor goddess of plenty, there were dice floating just above the world and a mess of little clay figures and gaming counters. Several dozen gods were watching the beach. It seemed simpler when you were up here, Om thought. It was all a game. We're like eagles up here. Sometimes 
which you have taught us how to fly. Then we let go. He said to the occult world in general, There's people going to die down there. But Sortian God of the Sun didn't even bother to look round. That's what they're for. In his hand, he was holding a dice box that looked very much like a human skull with rubies in the eye sockets. Om turned to the little goddess of plenty. What's this, love? Can I have a look? Thanks. He emptied some of the fruit out. Then he tapped the solar god on the shoulder. Hey, sunshine! When the god looked around, Om broke the cornucopia over his head. It wasn't a normal thunderclap. It stuttered like the shyness of supernovas, great ripping billows of sound that tore up the sky. Sand fountained up and whirled across the recumbent bodies lying face down on the beach. Lightning stabbed down and sympathetic fire leapt from spear tip and sword point. Simony looked up at the booming darkness. What the hell's happening? He nudged the body next to him. It was Argovisti. They stared at one another. More thunder smashed across the sky. We're dead if we stay here. Come on! They staggered through the spray and sand and crawled into the calm under the turtle. Other people had already had the same idea. Shadowy figures sat or sprawled in the darkness. The gods are angry, said Bavorius. Bloody furious, said Argovisti. There was a shower of grapes outside. Then a piece of cornucopia shrapnel bounced off the roof of the turtle, which rocked on its spiked wheels. But why be angry with us? said Argovisti. We're doing what they want. Bavorius tried to smile. Gods, eh? Can't live with them. Can't live without them. Someone nudged Simony and passed him a soggy cigarette. He took a puff and passed it along to the next hunched figure. Thank you. Bavorius produced a flask from somewhere. Pass it round. Thank you. The turtle rocked to a thunderbolt. Someone tapped Simony on the shoulder, creating a strange tingling sensation. Thank you. I have to go. Simony was aware of the rush of air, a sudden breath in the universe. He looked around in time to see a wave lift a ship out of the water and smash it against the dunes. A distant scream coloured the wind. There were people under there, said Argovisti. Simony dropped the flask. Come on. And no one, as they hauled on timbers in the teeth of the gale, as they used their helmets under the wreckage, asked who it was they were digging for or what kind of uniform they'd been wearing. Fog rolled in on the wind, hot and flashing with electricity, and still the sea pounded down. Simony hauled on a spar, and then someone grasped the other end. He looked up into Brutha's eyes. They pulled aside some planking. There was a man there, armour and leathers so stained as to be unrecognisable but alive. Then a couple of dice dropped onto the sand. They sparkled and crackled for a while and evaporated. The sea calmed. The fog went ragged and curled into nothingness. The sun was visible again. Once again, there was the sensation of the universe drawing breath. The gods appeared, transparent and shimmering in and out of focus. The sun glinted off a hint of golden curls and wings and lyres. Om was in the throng, standing right behind the Sortian god of thunder. It was noticeable, if only to Baratha, that the thunder god's right arm disappeared up behind his back in a way that suggested someone was twisting it. When the gods spoke, they spoke in unison. What they said was heard by each combatant in his own language. It boiled down to, One, this is not a game. Two, here and now, you are alive. And then it was over. You'd make a good bishop, said Baratha. Me, said Didactylus. I'm a philosopher. Good. You can think up a better way of ruling the country. They were sitting in the Cenobiarch's garden. Far overhead, an eagle circled, looking for anything that wasn't a tortoise. I like the idea of democracy. You have to have someone everyone distrusts. That way, everyone's happy. 
And what are you going to do? I've got a copy out the library. But you can't read and write. No, but I can see and draw. Two copies, one to keep here. He looked out at the shimmering line of the desert. Funny. He'd been as happy as he'd ever been in the desert. No one, not even Baratha, noticed that old Lutze wasn't around any more. In fact, he'd packed his broom and his bonsai mountains and had gone by secret tunnels to the hidden valley in the central peaks. The abbot was playing chess in the long gallery. All went well, he said without looking up. Very well, Lord. I had to nudge things a little there. The abbot looked up. Um, the books say that Baratha died and there was a century of terrible warfare. Mm. You know my eyesight isn't what it was, Lutze. Well, it's not entirely like that now. Just so long as it all turns out all right in the end. Yes, Lord. There are a few weeks before your next assignment. Why don't you have a little rest? Thank you, Lord. As Lutze left, the abbot glanced up at his opponent. Good man, that. Your move. The opponent looked long and hard at the board. Remind me again how the little horse-shaped ones move. Eventually, Baratha died, in unusual circumstances. He had reached a great age, but this was not unusual in the church. He rose at dawn and wandered over to the window. He liked to watch the sunrise. The sun shone off the copper dome of the library. It was the biggest non-magical library in the world, and people came from everywhere to visit. Baratha made a mental note to inquire about the progress of the new wing. There were too many complaints about overcrowding these days. It was while he was eating his breakfast that the subdeacon, whose job it was to read him his appointments for the day and tactfully make sure he wasn't wearing his underpants on the outside, shyly offered him congratulations. Hmm? One hundred years since you walked in the desert, sir. Really? Can't be more than sixty years, boy. One hundred, Lord. We had a look in the records. Really? One hundred years? <laughs> One hundred years time? Baratha laid down his spoon very carefully and stared at the wall opposite him. The subdeacon found himself turning to see what the Cenobiarch was looking at, but there was only the whiteness of the wall. Good Lord! <laughs> I forgot. He laughed. I forgot. One hundred years, eh? But here and now we... Cenobiarch? The subdeacon stepped closer, the blood draining from his face. Lord? He turned and ran for help. Baratha's body toppled forward almost gracefully, smacking into the table. His bowl overturned and Gruel dropped down onto the floor. And then Baratha stood up, without a second glance at his corpse. I wasn't expecting you. Death stopped leaning against the wall. How fortunate you were. Baratha followed the gaunt figure through the wall where there was black sand. The light was brilliant, crystalline, in a black sky filled with stars. And what is at the end of the desert? Judgment! Baratha considered this. Which end? Death grinned and stepped aside. A hunched figure sat clutching its knees. It looked paralysed with fear. He stared. Vorbis? He looked at death. But Vorbis died a hundred years ago. Yes. He had to walk it all alone. All alone with himself. If he dared. The black-on-black -black eyes stared imploringly at Baratha who reached out without thinking, and then hesitated. He was a murderer, a torturer, cruel, callous, compassionless. Yes, he's Vorbis, he sighed. But I'm me. Vorbis stood up uncertainly and followed Baratha across the desert. Death watched them walk away.